I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I, I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. Help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on influence, persuasion, and behavior profiling. I teach that to intelligence agencies and the general public today. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor, I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together the number one body language tactics.com course with Scott Rouse, and I spend my time in business. All right, today we're going to talk about Darrell Brooke. And there's so much information that comes with them. I'm not going to talk much. Greg, why don't you tell us about him? Yeah, so let's just cut to the chase. The most important part is that he is the, called the Waukesha Christmas Parade, um, whatever they call him, killer. But he drove through a crowd, was convicted of driving through that crowd, and I think he just received a very harsh sentence, I think life in prison. The inter This interrogation is hours after the act occurred. This interrogation went on for five hours. Brooks had a history of mental illness, including starting at 11 years old. He was diagnosed as bipolar. At 12, he was uh, put into a mental hospital and had a lot of violent, violent run-ins with the law over time around assault of all kinds. Go and look his record up. He's got a long, long, long rap sheet. Better read it, okay? Um, and I know you've, had, you've heard it before, so you can't understand that. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you have any questions before I start for me? Only thing I want to know is, what in the heck am I being charged with anything? Well, she's making some, like I said, alleged allegations against you, kind of, you know, for being physical. So that's what, you know, if that's BS, that's what I'm looking to hear from you. Okay? Total BS. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of, we couldn't track her down, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. It's this typical back and forth stuff that guys like you go through with their baby mama all the time. And they're all, you know, there's a lot of guys out there in your spot. You know, and a lot of times, you know, maybe it's, it's not always fair to them, but that's kind of what I, I wish they had a law to where people can, if you do that, you should get in trouble. Sure. Yeah. Like, why? You shouldn't be able to just be like, oh, I'm pissed off, so I'm going to yeah. call and do this. Yeah. Like, that's, why would you put me in that situation and then you know we're going to end up being together anyway? And that's why would you do that? Trying to judge that credibility. Yep, yeah, and that's that's total BS. So that's what I, I'm. That's why we're sitting in here with you to try to to siphon through, sift through the BS if that's what we got, and just go from there. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. All right, Greg. What do you got? Yeah, this is actually going to be one of my favorites we've done in a while because this is a really good example of how interrogation really works. And we're going to see him starting right off. Both people have something to gain. Both people are trying to get information. This guy right out of the gate starts off with some guilty knowledge. What am I being charged with? He knows this is not about the girlfriend. He thinks it's about something else, but he's trying to figure it out. Is he trying to figure out how many people died? What's he trying to figure out? We can't tell, but he's smart. He's street savvy. He's probably had an inter this came, same kind of interaction with the police before watch him as he talks through this he's trying to be helpful he's trying to be friendly he's fishing he's trying to get information his brows are up and his illustrators are in time with his message his adapters are there as his leg starts balancing and this mask is actually helping him if you don't believe that when he has a stressful moment he'll push that mask up this interrogator is the kind that i refer to as concentric circles interrogation meaning his questioning is going to get progressively tighter and progressively tighter and progressively tighter until he gets what he wants. Dora Vasquez Helner, one of my favorite army interrogators that I did a show called uh, We Can Make You Talk for History Channel with, is very much this kind of interrogation approach. She can break people with just questions, and a good questioner can do that. This is a first step. He's trying to put this guy at the scene. This feels like an interrogation. You can feel a glass wall between the two people as one's trying to get information from the other and the other's trying to get information from him at the same time. That's often how it goes. And then you see exaggerated him exaggerate his movement as he steps into his first ploy. Because what this guy's trying to do is say, you were with your girlfriend and she was here. He's trying to put him at the scene. So good start. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree with you. He's doing recon at the top. He's trying to find out. He keep that's why throughout this he'll be saying, "What am I being charged with? What's going on here? What's ha what's happening?" Because he's just waiting for that thing to, for that for the other shoe to drop. And they're using this just like you said to make sure they can prove he was there. 
As we go through this, one of the things to pay attention to are his illustrators. I'm all the time talking about illustrators because they're important. Those are the things we use if your hands, your head, your eyebrows to emphasize specific words or phrases. As we go through this, we'll watch them get really big and we'll watch them get really small. And we'll watch them end up in spots they shouldn't when he uses his illustrators. Instead of doing this, he'll do this. And they'll be happening when there are no words. But we'll talk about that as we go along. As we go through this, we'll also see his voice becomes animated. It's going at a pretty good clip, and it's really loud. And he's much louder than the uh, interrogator. So let's, let's listen for it to go up and down as we go through this, because we'll, we'll be able to gauge the amount of stress he's under. Uh, th that's one of the things we'll be able to, to use to have a better understanding of what kind of stress he's under. And even though he's trying to show he's worried about this domestic violence situation, um, he, he knows that, this, that the other thing is coming. It has to be. I mean, he's hoping it isn't, but it has to be. That's why he commits so hard to this uh, domestic violence thing and, and acts like it's such a horrible thing. It's so hard. It is horrible. Domestic violence is horrible. But he goes a little bit too far with it, trying to make it a really big deal as in comparison to what he's in trouble for that he's really going to talk to him about. So let's pay attention to everything from his hands to his head to his uh, mouth. This It's covered most of the time, but you'll see uh, when he pulls his uh, mask off. Let's, let's, let's pay attention to all that stuff as we go through because all of it's going to start changing as we move along. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think a lot of people have asked for this, you know, not only because of the current nature of it, but also they've gone, hey, this guy's got a mask on and the camera angle is at a certain angle. And what do you do when you can't see the face so well? Well, we can always see all kinds of little elements in there and you're going to see us all pick up on that. But this is a great opportunity for me to go, OK, so I just won't look at the face at all i'm going to focus completely on what his hands are doing and what the bigger kind of what i would call the gross body is doing that's not because all of us can't pick up things that are happening in the face but i thought it'd be interesting to kind of thin slice stuff even thinner what information can you get from a really thin slice now there's a risk in this which is the slice is too thin and i would never say hey make the slice really thin but what a great opportunity just to narrow it down so let me narrow it down for you really tight elbows in there that we can see okay so we can see that he's already protecting this ventral area vulnerable area here so uh, under some stress there we can see anxiety in the leg you'll see his hand uh, bob up and down that's because the leg is moving uh, could be um could be drugs that he could be taking at the time though it's not really continual so i'm going to say there's elements that are talked about that you get this little kind of leg jiggle that that uh, amplifies in the hand so a moment of stress there You've got this head wobble that goes on there seems very indirect uh, i think that's because he's trying to work out like which crime are you going for at the moment so he's trying to assess the situation he reels back on that accusation but it seems like it's a bit too pronounced that reel back i think it might be even surprised as to which accusation is coming at him just then uh and then we get the head to the hands uh to, so sorry that the 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 hand to the forehead here it looks like but i think it's a full eye block there as he also submits to gravity the whole body goes down so straight off the bat looking at the whole body here and it, kind of ignoring what we could see in the eyes or the face uh, um, i see somebody already confused slightly looking for what's going on and under stress already but chase what do you got on this one yeah so I, i'm going to break down the interrogator for a minute and one thing i'm going to do what greg told you a second ago this is a great interrogation we're witnessing some awesome stuff i'm going to give you some things that could have been different not could have been better per se but in my opinion some of the things that could have been different some things that went well the first thing is the seating arrangement the yeah. seating arrangement should almost never be done this way ideally the rule of thumb is you want no more than a corner of the table in between you so if anything, uh, that's what you want. And as an example, the interrogation of this kid uh, who was a shooter named Nicholas Cruz had a great arrangement where the interrogator and the suspect were both on the same side of the table. They were together on the same side. 
So when he confirms that it's it's BS, we see a postural retreat. We see almost a two o'clock eye accessing movement, a confirmation glance to the other interviewer. There's some rapid left and right eye movement there. There's some facial touching with this mask thing that you, uh, Scott, you were talking about. There's a rapid increase and in difference from his otherwise predictable behavior. And what we see here that Mark was just talking about the elbows coming in, this is I call elbow retraction. Uh, when our bodies are doing stuff that's fear-based, you'll see the skeleton protect arteries, skeleton protecting arteries. So this elbows move in and we're protecting this artery right here called the brachial. And, you know, we see somebody get the crap scared out of them on YouTube. Their shoulders go up like this. Their, their arms come in. So our body automatically starts protecting these arteries. And that's kind of one of the things we're going to see here. And we're going to see that again. So I think there's a high likelihood that there is something off here and should be maybe asking some more questions, which we'll get into. And when he says a lot of guys out there are in your spot, he's emphasizing the commonality of a situation to reduce the stress. Uh, and this is an in interrogation is called socializing. We call that socializing. I watched this video first with no idea what's coming next. So my notes here contain essentially a behavioral profile that we can use later. He's socially intelligent, makes eye contact with both interviewers at key moments where he desires agreement from them, comfortable using profanity while still showing respect to them. He has a semi-fearful demeanor. His hands were kept under the table almost the whole time, showed discomfort when moving toward the other interviewers and when placing his hands on the table, which belongs to the interviewers. So let's just take that quick uh, behavioral baseline and go from here. Do you have any questions before I start for me? Only thing I want to know is, what in the hell am I being charged with anything? Well, she's making some, like I said, alleged allegations against you, kind of, you know, for being physical. So that's what, you know, if that's BS, that's what I'm looking to hear from you. Okay. Total BS. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of we couldn't track her down, so that's that's kind of where we're at. It's this typical back and forth stuff that guys like you go through with their baby mama all the time. And they're all, you know, there's a lot of guys out there in your spot, you know. <laughs> and a lot of times, you know, maybe it's, it's not always fair to them. But that's kind of what I, I wish, wish they had a out. law to where people can, if you do that, you should get in trouble. Sure. Yeah. Like, why? You shouldn't be able to just be like, oh, I'm pissed off, so I'm going to yeah. call and do this. Yep. Like, right? that's... Why would you put me in that situation and then you know we're going to end up being together anyway? And that's why why would you do that? Trying to judge that that's, credibility. Yep, yeah, and that's, that's total BS. So that's, what I, I'm, that's why we're sitting in here with you to try to, to siphon through, sift through the BS if that's what we got. And just go from Crazy, there. Man. Does that make sense? Yeah. Huh. All right. No. What brought you to Waukesha yesterday? How did you get out here? I was meeting up with a friend to watch the Packer game. Okay. That's the only reason why I was, was out here. Where did you go to watch the game? To a friend named uh, Stephanie. A house, a bar? Or... A house. And, yeah, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable or anything, but what's the address there? What's I have on no there? idea about what we saw. I don't know the street. What was I it don't... near? I know you had to see something near it. Uh, so what was it near? Like a gas station? Have you been to the house before? No. Never before? No. What's Stephanie's last name? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. When did you guys set this up? Um, maybe a couple of days ago. Okay. Like I said, I, I have a few friends. I have a few friends in Milwaukee that have people out here, so. Okay. It's not, I don't, like I said last night, I don't know the streets in Waukesha. It's not where I usually hang out at, so I, I couldn't say, well, this street, this street, and this, you know, I couldn't. All right. Stephanie, like a friend of yours or like a friend of a friend? A, a friend of a friend, mutual okay. friend. And what did you say her last name was? I have no idea. How long have you known her? That was my first time meeting her. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we're getting a lot of what I would call supplicant palms. So these palms of, 
you know, hey, give me a break or hand me something. Some palms that could kind of hold something up. But I can see from above, we're getting a lot of double shoulder shrug as well. Kind of like, hey, you know, what can you do? And he puts that together with, I have no idea. In fact, he's got straight palms down here. I got no idea. I think with him, what we get is when he's, when he knows he needs to lie, he becomes way more direct. There's way more line of energy in there when he knows this is a lie that I need to tell. Otherwise, when he's, he's still lying, but when it's not so important, he's just more erratic, more staccato. And that, if, if it were any other situation from this, this might be that you kind of didn't, uh, you didn't know that he's, he's lying most of the time or being deceptive most of the time, could be a bit of a problem because usually you'd expect these strong lines of energy to be honest. Usually you might expect, you know, these supplicant gestures and this, this gesture of, hey, what what are you going to do to be more honest? The difference here is the change in energy, the change in how dramatic he is, uh, how indirect he is when he's kind of unpurposefully lying and how direct and energetic he is when he knows he needs to win this lie. So look at the difference here between staccato and indirect and when he's more direct and more energized that for me is a deviation from from baseline and therefore for me says we should pay more attention to what he's saying in these more energized direct areas i think uh what i take from this particular uh excerpt is he thinks his tactic of um i have no idea is going to work for him. He's quite pleased with that tactic. And we see him play it a couple of times in this one. And I think we're going to see it further down the line uh, as well. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I get questions all the time about what does resistance to interrogation mean? The best possible resistance training is inoculation. By that, I mean, the more times you're exposed, the less likely you are to fall for it. This guy's been exposed. And I can see it in the way he, he's responding. Interestingly, he came with information prepared. You can tell he's emphatic when he's prepared. Boom, 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 boom. But he only iteratively releases information as he's asked a question. So when you ask him a friend, boom, there are short, short sentences. When he's not prepared to answer, like, did you know her name? No, no, I didn't know her name. Too much information, more words. That shows you, and you can see the difference. He stammers when he's doing that instead of delivering with quick dropped information. My favorite thing, and I talk about this all the time with people, Scott, you talk about timing of illustrators. I talk about out of frame illustrators. The fish was that big. Well, people don't do that. They hold their hands in front of them when they're talking. Do, maybe he has an anomaly, not likely, because we'll see him using his hands other times in front of him. But when he's talking about his friend, his hands are out of frame. He does that head bobble thing again, which is neither a yes or a no. I think anytime you see this guy poorly planned, you're going to see him stammer and move around and you'll see him close up. Now, this thing where you're talking about elbows to the side, Chase, I take another approach, similar, but another approach. I say we're the only mammal that walks around with our soft white underbelly unprotected. So when something happens, as importantly as those arteries, there's a liver and a whole bunch of stuff that a sword would cut through or a stick would gouge and people make an exoskeleton. Got a great example of that in my hit theater history where a guy panicked and stuck his head up and got cracked in the head with a sword. So when people are feeling that stress, they're going to do something. And he closes his elbows to his side, holds his hands up like, what can I do? And shrinks his head in. The only difference is his elbows are locked when he does it. So it looks really weird. I kind of think I could put a name to that and call it Franken turtling. But whatever <laughs> he's doing, he's turtling what we would call shrinking your head and making your your um, space much smaller. And then he does a request for approval. Hard to see a lot of facial expression that raising my brow when I'm asking you to believe something. And I have no idea of her last name. And I just put that's because she ain't got one. He didn't make it up. There's, there's congruent messaging. You want to know what his normal messaging looks like. He goes back to say, I don't know the streets here. That's his normal. So we got a baseline for talking about something he has no reason to lie about. And we see him iteratively releasing information and then exploding to try to justify. Love the nervous laugh when he has to justify something. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so as from a baseline perspective, if we can do that with this video, since it's full of crazy stuff, 
there's he's accessing apparently genuine geography at around 11 o'clock when he's saying something. So I would assume that there's some genuineness to that. And he mentions his friend and he motions all the way to his right with both hands. So make a mental note of that. He motioned to his right side with both hands. Make a note of that. One other thing to take note of here is how rapidly he shifts between the interviewers when they ask questions. And this is called threat locking. This is like I hear a tiny peep out of one person and I rapidly move my eyes and head to that where that sound came from. So when someone rapidly moves their eyes or their body to adjust in a social situation, it indicates a higher than normal level of stress. Most of the time that you're going to see this in your life is when someone's experiencing social anxiety. You'll see these rapid movements at a party or a networking, especially at a networking event. But occasionally, you'll see it during deception, which I think we're seeing here. The stress goes up, and he has to lock on instantaneously to what those people are saying because they are a potential threat. But they've presented themselves as good interrogators, as a source of value and protection. So they represent both sides of threat and rescuer at the same time, which any good interrogator should be. Scott? All right. When the interviewer at, says, uh, or asks him, how did you get here? His arm com co covers his stomach and it freezes there. And this is a barrier. Again, protecting himself as well. I'm sure his limbic system is just going wild, on, off, on, off, then on and staying on. It's got to be a, a, a very stressful for him. And we see that on him. Now, when we focus on his illustrators, this entire interview is a fantastic study of how they, uh, how illustrators are supposed to lock up with the words you're saying, but they don't. And that's because he's got cognitive dissonance going on. He's got so many things. He's, he's structuring his story and hoping it's matching up with what he said before. He's got to remember what all he said, make sure everything's still laid in place, and he has to lay anything else in there. Then it has to work with that because the, the interrogator is doing a great job. He'll ask him things that would happen way in the future and sort of work his way back a little bit, which is which is beautiful him doing this because then he has to think stuff up and then lay it in there. So he's really watching his words and watching how he talks to make sure that he has the uh, right uh, puzzle parts to put in this puzzle that's going to be a story. Now, quite often, but not every time, when someone is speaking and their illustrators don't land where they're supposed to, that suggests that they're being uh, dishonest, that, dis that suggests they're being deceptive. And here we're seeing it writ large. Now, Albert Ray uh, is a, a body language, um, I guess you'd almost call him a scientist at this point. And from his studies, we found out that the person who is being honest is more likely to use more illustrators. And the person who's being deceptive uses less illustrators. But we're seeing him go nuts on this one because he's overdoing it. He's overplaying. He knows he has to, to, to make these statements and make them stick or he wants to. So they're too big. And you guys are referring to his, his open hands like this. I refer to that as mercy hands because, oh, God, please believe me. Please believe what I'm saying. And it's not like this. It's not like this, but it's like this. And the palms are forward a little bit like that. So that's when you see that. That usually tells me, or that's when I always keep focusing on how many times it pops up. That says that for me, that's a deception, a deceptive cue. I don't know if if I would count on it every time, but it sure pops up a lot around those situations. Um, another thing about illustrators, I'm going to focus on those during this whole thing. We know this guy's lying. We already know he's lying. So we're. It's a great study to see how these things, when they don't land when they're supposed to how we can look at, at his illustrators and we already know we understand the veracity of them because they're not worth anything because he's making this stuff up as he goes along some of it and making sure like i said before all the puzzle pieces match so keep paying attention to his illustrators how he's using them and when he starts like uh, greg was saying earlier they go to one side and they're way out of frame when he does those it's so important because these are being overdone and they're too big and when you see someone doing that, it doesn't mean they're lying to you. It doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. But you'll get that little feeling in there that tells you something's just not right. And you'll get that feeling, as you probably already have, uh, watching this. So remember that feeling you've got. If you see it again, don't say, oh, I know they're lying because I feel that way. But continue to look for other things, the other things we talk you, to you about and teach you, so you can start making the a correct decision for yourself. Now, what brought you to Waukesha yesterday? How did you get out here? I was meeting up with a friend to watch the Packer game. Okay. That's the only reason why I was out here. 
Where did you go to watch the game? To a friend named uh, Stephanie. Her house, a bar, or a house. Yeah, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable or anything, but what's the address there? What street I have on no street? idea about what we saw. I don't know the street. What was I it near? Know. I know you had to see something near it. Uh, so what was it near? Like a gas station. Have you been to the house before? No. Never before? No. What's Stephanie's last name? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. When did you guys set this up? Um, maybe a couple of days ago. Okay. Like I said, I, I have a few friends. I have a few friends in Milwaukee that have people out here, so. Okay. It's not, I don't, like I said last night, I don't know the streets in Waukesha. It's not where I usually hang out at, so I, I couldn't say, well, this street, this street, and this, but, you know, I couldn't. All right. Stephanie, like a friend of yours or like a friend of a friend? A, a friend of a friend, mutual okay. friend. And what share your last like, name was? I have no idea. How long have you known her? That was my first time meeting her. So, so how did you get the number to know the house to go to? A friend. A friend. <laughs> so how did you get to her house? My friend. I went with my friend. Okay, who's that? Uh, my friend, I don't really want to say his name. I don't know if that's going to incriminate him in anything. So. Okay, so let's go with this. How did you come? I know you saw Erica yesterday in Waukesha because we talked to her. Now, I don't know everything that went on, and I'm not saying I believe everything she told the other officers. How did you come to meet with her in Waukesha, one? And two, you say you don't know Waukesha, but where did you meet her? gas station, a park. I know you met her. Where did you meet her? What what happened yesterday? Yeah, so, Because if this is BS, like you say, and I know you met her, what happened? I met so her. What happened when you met her? Where did you meet her? Let's start with that. By a gas station. Okay. I don't know <laughs> what I was supposed to be getting some money from her. How did, okay. For what? Um, it was the rest of my money that she had of mine that she was holding for me. Okay, how much? Um, it was supposed to be $350. Okay. And All right, Chase, what do you got? A few videos ago, I said that this guy was socially intelligent. And I say this because there's a reason he represented himself in court. Either he's a moron or he has probably won every argument with anybody he's ever tried to argue with in his life, which gave him artificial confidence that he could do this. Dude, I, I got that in my notes, too. <laughs> I don't think he's a moron. I really don't. Uh, he's a POS, but uh, definitely not a moron. We're still seeing this right side reference to describe things and... Keep a note of that. When he speaks about the money she's holding for him, there's a very, very clear gesture to his left using both hands, complete opposite side, and it's an out-of-frame gesture like Greg was just teaching you about, which means, based on the way he usually speaks, there's a drop in the ability to formulate or produce sentences, and this is called a loss of fluency. So his fluency also drops at that exact point. He becomes less fluent. After this gesture, he pulls his hands into his stomach. This is uh, this is in this weird way, and this kind of seems unusual, probably to you too. And this may not be deception, but it's definitely a place where elicitation and more questioning would need a very sharp increase. And right at this three hundred fifty dollars moment, there's more deviation here. There's upward tone. Fading facts, which you might hear from Scott all about. Maybe Scott will tell us about that. There's hesitancy. There's distancing language where he said, uh, and then supposed to be. And as an interrogation note, legal pads and pins are typically a bad idea in interrogation room. The more permanent the notes you're taking appear to the other person, the more official and permanent. Those two words. You want your notes to be unofficial and non-permanent, which means small scrap of paper that you tore in half and using a pencil makes it appear less formal 
and less permanent. And it's easier to take notes while the person's talking because they don't feel like it's being permanently inscribed on something that's official. That's all I got for this one. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's talk about interrogation. Those are good pointers, I think. But let's talk about interrogation and the differences. If you're doing a full-blown intelligence interrogation, it's really normal to have some kind of record keeping. The other thing to use it for is a prop. I might leave this there for you to get, feeling like you have some power when you tear it up as I come back in and go, yeah, that's all recorded. Hope you had a good time. But yeah, I, now you just incriminated yourself. So there's a lot of reasons you might use it and other reasons you might not. So, And I think Chase's point there is a very good one. They're more liable to say something if they don't think you're writing it down, and that's important. But if you're doing a long, drawn-out interrogation, sometimes you'll see these guys do it. So just give them a pass in that. Um, here's an interesting one for you. He leans back and exposes his throat. Now, we always tell you that people often will close up and, and, and cover their throat when they're feeling threatened. This is where culture matters. Culture really matters here. Because if he lives in a culture where that means, nope, I'm being defiant, and he's throwing his chin up, and he's, then that becomes part of it. So you got to pay attention and say, you can lie with your chin up. It's just not as common. When you see a false interrogate, a false confession, often in interrogation, you'll see a guy with his chin up confessing. And we're going to talk about confession dynamics as we get closer to the end of this, because there's a couple of places where they could have done something and maybe gotten a little bit further. But this guy's a master of what he's doing. And Chase, I agree with you. I had the same thing. He's probably won most of the arguments he's ever been in. He just doesn't know the rules. That's what I always say. If you get arrested, get a lawyer, because you don't know the rules. And you can't argue if you don't know how to play the game. <clears throat> What's interesting, though, is with his throat unprotected, he starts to show clusters, which is what we look for, of behavior that indicates something is changing. One is that nervous head bob, and he starts and stops sentences, what I call cadence deviations. As he's going through, he'll stop to hesitate and create new details. That nervous laugh and that crossing the abdomen are his insecurity moments. You're going to see it over and over and over. So he's protecting his vital organs, and you'll even see him adapting a little bit, meaning release nervous energy with his hands as this thing comes up. Um, you could tell though he thinks and then he redirects. He's trying to get him off topic at every turn when he talks about something other than the topic they're asking about. When he says it's supposed to be, he's distancing as he makes up how much money they're supposed to be there and his voice lilts up at $350. Look, that's not in his pattern. I would go, hold, hold on a minute. What do you mean? What do you mean it's supposed to be? When he starts to talk about money, his hands roll into him. Don't know that means anything specific, but I would like to know what it means. Because when something that changes that dramatically, it, there's something going on in somebody's head to cause them to do it. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, on the, on that point, yes, we get these these broken lines there. What I mean by broken lines is if, you, if you've got a, a strong line of energy, it means you can actually hold stuff. You can defend yourself. Like your hands work much better if joints are straightened out a little bit. The moment all the joints start to break then you, you, you can't do all the things your hands are meant to do. And so we've got this gesture here in at the stomach area, which means certainly uh, he's under a lot of stress at that point because his joints aren't functioning as they should function. He's very uh, unsure, let's say, of, of what he's saying there. So let's go to the start of this. Um, a, a friend, a friend, and he gestures right off as, as, as Greg, you've been saying, out of frame. It's a really big gesture there, a really big like, let's just move this along. Let's, let's avoid that. So a real kind of redirect on that one there. Um, I don't want to say his name and there's a surrender gesture and then it's very indirect at the same time a direct uh, surrender gesture would be i'm not saying his name I'm not going to tell you okay an indirect one is i'm not going to say that name it's rather like uh, a, a push away gesture that's held back and waving around at the same time again quite distracting and indirect um uh, get some money from her. Again, there's a surrender and move along out of frame as well. So he's trying to push it along. Oh, by the way, uh, there's some footage just come out a few weeks back of Jeff Jeffrey Epstein, which we'll cover when the full footage comes out. He does these gestures a great deal, taking the story, moving it along. So subscribe, subscribe, hit that subscribe button, and then you'll be around for when that Jeffrey Epstein interview comes out, and we will take a good look at that. Uh, and that's all I got on that one. So, Scott, what do you got on this? 
All right. When he's asking, I got the number to the house and he says, and we've heard it before, like you were saying earlier, Greg, a friend, a friend. He pulls an Alec Baldwin at that point. And his illustrator starts with both hands again, like you got, but he was saying to sort of rehash and they swing back and forth as he answers. The second time that they happen like that, he doesn't say anything until after the uh, illustrator is executed. So he's, he's got a thought in his mind and it's happening, but he's doing this to help create uh, something in the interviewer's minds, to help them think, you know, like that. So when he, when he does that, He's helping to create that feeling of, of things have changed, things have moved or whatever it is he's trying to get him to understand and trying to get him to accept that. The ex explanation of why he was meeting the girls is where we see a dramatic change in his behavior. His cadence slows down, his volume drops, uh, he pauses and he's pausing because he's creating that story like we were talking about before. He's trying to come up with those puzzle pieces and make sure everything's falling into place. He has to check what he said so far, what the story is so far, because they're going way out here and making him come back here and fill in those little spots. Brilliant technique. It's very subtle, but it's working really well at this point. Uh, his words are drawn out and his posture changes as he bends forward. And not only does he bend forward, he comes down like this. I'm under the impression that's more of a protective uh, situation as well. His, once again, his awkward illustrators are really big and they're really awkward and they're not connecting where they should be. And this time around, at, toward the end, where he's talking about his money, then when, that's where we start hearing fading facts as he starts talking about it. He gets really quiet. That's where everything starts slowing down as Caden slows down. His words are drawn out, and he starts getting really small at that point. So we know it's not true, but that's a great example of seeing exactly what it looks like when you know it's not true. And we've told you about these things on other people before where we didn't know if it wasn't true yet. And it's been, it was months later we found out that it wasn't true. But you can see these things now, since we know this guy isn't being honest, what these cues and tells look like as we go through. So this is a great uh, study for you guys to, to be watching. All right, we good? Yeah. All right. I'm going to give that one to Greg again. That was good, Chase. You got to give a little stank <laughs> on it with that face. No, you're just uh, <laughs> placating. <laughs> so, so how did you get the number to know the house to go to? A friend. A friend. <laughs> so, how did you get to her house? My friend. I went with my friend. Okay, who's that? Uh, my friend. I don't really want to say his name. I don't know if that's going to incriminate him in anything. So. Okay, so, let's go with this. How did you come? I know you saw Erica yesterday in Waukesha. Because we talked to her. Now, I don't know everything that went on, and I'm not saying I believe everything told the other officers how did you come to meet with her in Waukesha one and two you say you don't know Waukesha but where did you meet her a gas station a park I know you met her where did you meet her what what happened yesterday yeah, so because if this is BS like you say and I know you met her what happened I met so her what happened when you met her where did you meet her let's start with that by a gas station okay I don't know <laughs> What I was supposed to be getting some money from her. How did okay? For what? Um, it was the rest of my money that she had of mine that she was holding for me. Okay, how much? Um, it was supposed to be three hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. And okay. And what did she? Why did she have it? Why, why was she holding well, she, it? She had been holding it for me for a few weeks now. But like I said, I hadn't seen her. She had seen it. Right, but what was she holding, why did she have it? Why was she holding it for you? She was just holding it for me because I told her to hold it for me. But this was, it didn't have anything to do with, this was weeks ago she had been holding the money. And because I had no contact with her, I couldn't tell her. And my mom wasn't going to let her come to the house to bring it. Mm -hmm. And I told her, look, man, if I'm going to be out there, I meet up with you and, and get the money, but I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not having sex with you. And she was just like, oh, you want to keep? I'm like, I'm not finna do none of that. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm not supposed to be around you. I get that. I understand that. I'm not going to lie to y'all. I'm not supposed to be around you. I love you to death, man. You're my baby mama. I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't supposed to be like 
a hangout thing. I told her, I'm like, I'm out here. And she's like, oh, where you at? Where you at? Where you at? And I'm like, look, I'll meet up with you to get the money and, you know, give you a hug or whatever. But she was like, well, yeah, I need something. I'm like, no, we can't do it all, all that. I'm not going to have sex with you. I'm not going to hang out with you or none of that. All right. So you told her you weren't, you weren't going to do any of that stuff. No. How did you set the meeting up? Did you did you talk to her on the phone, Facebook Messenger, text message? Cause I talked to her. She, I don't think she said anything about that. So just, I mean, if she's BS, how did you how did yeah, you get meeting with her? I didn't. She, this is what she does. If well, she hold on one second. Hold on, one thing at a time. How did you set the meeting with her? How do I verify? That's what, that's what I'm saying. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so as we say, we're always looking for deviations from baseline. And just as Chase was saying, well, you know, where is where is the baseline? Well, we do know he's he's kind of indirect quite a lot. Uh, and then suddenly will become quite direct. And though in many cases we go, well, when somebody's being direct, they're more likely to be telling the truth. The reverse can be true in the right situations. And I think uh, for this particular character, when he becomes more direct, it's just a more important lie. He just needs to convince us more. And so he says, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. And out comes the hands in supplication. Uh, again, you know, with an offering, essentially. The supplicant comes with an offering. I've got this to give you. I'm not going to lie to you. And suddenly the, the, the hands are energized. The lines of energy go right through the hands. And it's that point where I think, yeah, you, this is you lying. It's the exact opposite of what you're saying. Um, he... Uh, he suggests that she um, that she said she needed something. I think what he's suggesting is he's trying to set up the idea that uh, the woman here has uh, asked him for sex. I think I think that's what's going on. Well, at this particular time, his hands go right underneath his legs on that one. So I would suggest at no point had she got him along to ask for something to go on in that nature and that the whole incident is about something completely different because his fingers go right underneath his legs uh, at that point uh, I, I love what you were saying earlier chase about you know this person has probably won all all the arguments that he's ever had and you can see this quite aggressive big grandstanding behavior going on when he really needs to win this argument but you know and 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 is he super bright well he's bright enough in in probably the self-medication crowd that he's up, up up against somebody a little more medicated than him that he probably can with the right bombacity win most arguments there but as we saw in court he wasn't going to win uh, many arguments and the court pretty much and quite rightly I uh, shut him down on that one. Uh, but Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. He directs from why she's holding his money to she's had it for a few weeks. He never says why he gave her the money. He just says she has she has 300 bucks or something. Like his for some unknown reason, she has it. And then he uses his mask as sort of a little adapter at that point. We've seen that a couple of times so far. Usually an adapter, as Joe Navarro says, it's a pacifying behavior. And it, but it's a repetitive behavior, something to help calm you down, something when you're doing like this. But when you see those really quick ones like that, like when you're when someone's on TV and they're under stress because they're being asked uh, difficult questions and they may they're just let's just say they're being they're stressed they'll just shoot for a quick little thing like that on their face or maybe bite their lip or something really quick that that helps with that that's the same thing that's why we, I, I would assume that's why they're known as adapters because that's not a it's a pacifying behavior but it's not the repetitive type that joe's always talking about um then he says uh she was holding it to me be, holding the money for me because i told her to hold it for me well you know what are you going to do at that point then he attempts the key word being attempts to chaff and redirect but this is probably and i i don't know greg i'm gonna have to go see what you think about this probably the most lame chaff and redirect i've ever heard in my life little children do better than this when they're like i was a professional kid i've said it before and i could have done better at the, at three or four years old than this guy's doing at this age at this at this point but it, then again it shows he's he's usually lying to people i'm under the impression as i think you guys are as well and he wins every time and maybe these people are aren't as smart as he is not saying he's very smart 
but maybe their their intelligence quotient is a bit lower than his and he's used to talking to him like that and doing that he's used to getting away with it that's part of the narcissistic traits or something that we're seeing in his personality type as well he uses his left hand to help him give the impression that there uh, there are many things going on that aren't being addressed at this point there's a whole lot happening that, that they're not talking about uh, with the money situation and I, obviously there's more to it than than that as we're trying to find out but again keep in mind he's trying to piece this story together when he's lying getting to his illustrators when he's I think when he's thinking stuff up that's when we see his hands go low like you're talking about earlier Mark where he's just flat out lying they just go they disappear they don't disappear down there but the guys I think the interviewers can't see him but they go below his chest and they stay down there but man when he's going for it they get big and he's really trying to make it that happen I think that might, must be when he's on the on the run with one on creating one but when he's got one sort of set in that he's thought about I think his hands go low because there's no question about whether he's lying those at that point or not Greg what do you got I'm, I'm going to talk more about the interrogation than about his body language <clears throat> so a couple of things first of all yes he is a pretty bad chaff and redirect guy but he only tries chaff and redirect really one time I think the first part where he's talking about no sex and that has nothing to do with chaff and redirect what he's doing is trying to trade some guilt he's trying to say hey I know I had a restraining order and I was bumping up against it because he's fishing to see what they have even if you drove through a crowd of people you might not know how dramatic the charges are you know i mean he could not know how many people were killed or injured or any of that and not know if he has a felony if he has what who knows but he's fishing for that and there's that glass wall again he's poking and fishing and prodding while the other guy's poking and fishing and prodding and he uses a push pull word that whole thing about sex we didn't have any sex or anything well i would say who said anything about sex in a normal conversation when a person brings up a negotiation or push forward you always grab that because you can pull them closer to you through the glass wall this guy doesn't do it he lets him talk and he does some chaff in there in there scott but the guy doesn't let him redirect if you really want to know what matters and then he becomes kind of righteous about i didn't do anything i wasn't supposed to with regard to this to this whole um, to this whole restraining order but if you watch the detective you can know what matters when he starts talking about the sex thing he he my favorite thing, he puts his pen down, he crosses his arms, and he sits there and swivels in his chair. He's not interested, not in the least. And then the guy says, she asked, where are you at? You see him sit back up, lean back in, because now he just picked up what we would refer to as a source lead. doesn't matter what I'm trying to get. When you use words that mean something to me, and I know that they'll open the rest of the story, that's called a source lead. And what we do is we lean into that source and we start saying, well, tell me about that. And in this case, I would have said, wait a minute, how the hell did you tell her where you were if you didn't know where you were 30 seconds ago when I asked you a question? Something's wrong. Now you got incongruency of story. Now you can start to, to grind on him. And that's what he's headed for. And you can see it as he leans in. He gets interested and then he starts talking to the guy and the guy goes, I don't, this is what she does. That's where he's getting ready really to go and chaff and to redirect Scott, I think. And this cop is, this detective is on it and he goes, nope, I'm done with that. I want to know about this. Hold on one thing at a time. That's a powerful way to stop a chaff and redirect. You can use that in your life. If you don't know what we mean by chaff and redirect, it's I spew out information until you pick up on something I'm willing to talk about. And then we talk about that rather than the topic at hand. And he stops it right in his tracks. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, that's great. I, and I agree with y'all. I'm, I'm just going to break down, since y'all covered a lot of stuff here, I'm going to break down every single potentially uh, stressful or deceptive behavior here in a row. I'm just going to go through it in a giant row. So let's walk through this. I'm just going to lift it, list it in order of appearance. Failure to answer the question or non-answer statement. Adding irrelevant details times three. The leftward gesture is common when anyone's referencing the past. So people typically gesture to their left when referencing the past. So we tend to see timelines from left to right. So we'll see that very commonly in people. So we'll ignore that one for now. Next, a verbal contradiction about inability to contact her. A gestural timing mismatch. A loss of fluency. Bracing on the chair at that very key point, maybe grabbing that chair or like sticking his hands under his legs. Maybe I, I couldn't tell. The interviewer here may very well be aware of 
all of this. And we'll probably circle back to clean all of this stuff up. Some interviewers allow this behavior so that the cleanup is more confrontational once it gets to that point. It depends on the behavior of the suspect more than anything else. But in my interrogation training, when I teach interrogation, uh, and when I learned interrogation from my training, uh, when I went through school, there's one phrase I will never forget for the rest of my life, which is why I tend to clean up missing information immediately. And that phrase is undetected lying is rewarding. Can I add one comment? When you're yeah. interrogating, there's a whole lot of social noise. And by that, I mean, if you're a guy who has never lived in the same neighborhood as another guy, there's a whole lot of stuff you have to understand that you don't understand. This guy's got a lot of social noise because whatever culture, whatever things he's grown up in, a lot of times for African-Americans dealing with police, there's social noise, meaning there, there's a, an, an issue with the police officers, an issue with the way that culture plays so that there's le less eye contact and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of social noise in this guy that we can't overlook. And we have to say his culture and the cop's culture may not match, may not mesh. And that cop has to be keenly aware of that, not to make some kind of projection. It's a big part of it. Okay. And what did she, why did she have it? Why, why was she holding it? She, she had been holding it for me for a few weeks now, but like I said, I hadn't seen her. She had seen right. her. Why, was she holding, why did she have it? Why was she holding it for you? She was just holding it for me because I told her to hold it for me. But this was, it didn't have anything to do with, this was weeks ago she had been holding the money. And because I had no contact with her, I couldn't tell her. And my mom wasn't going to let her come to the house to bring it. Mm -hmm. And I told her, look, man, if I'm going to be out there, I'll meet up with you and, and get the money. But I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not having sex with you. And she was just like, oh, you want to I'm like, I'm not going to do none of that. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm not supposed to be around you. I get that. I understand that. I'm not going to lie to y'all. I'm not supposed to be around you. I love you to death, man. You're my baby mama. I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't supposed to be like a hangout thing. I told her, I'm like, I'm out here. And she's like, oh, where you at? Where you at? Where you at? And I'm like, look, I'll meet up with you to get the money and, you know, give you a hug or whatever. But she was like, well, yeah, I need something. I'm like, no, we can't do it all, all that. I'm not going to have sex with you. I'm not going to hang out with you or none of that. All right. So you told her you weren't, you weren't going to do any of that stuff. No. How did you set the meeting up? Did you did you talk to her on the phone, Facebook Messenger, text message? I talked to her. She, I don't think she said anything about that. So just, I mean, if she's BS, how did you how did yeah, you cause I didn't, meeting with her? I didn't. She, this is what she does. If well, she hold on one second. Hold on, one thing at a time. How did you set the meeting with her? How do I verify? That's what, that's what I'm saying. How do I verify? That's what, that's what I'm saying. She, if she can't get in touch with me, that's what she'll do. She'll go to social medias and do all this and try to okay. talk to people and all this and that. I got in contact with her through a mutual friend that we both know. And I was like, okay, tell her I'm out in Waukesha or whatever. And I meet up with her to get the money. And then she put us on the call. And she was just like, where are you at? Call? Yeah. And she was just like, where are you at? I'm like, look, I don't know where I'm at. Do you still got that money? She's like, yeah, I want to give you the money. And I want to, I want to do this and do that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to hang out with you. I'm going to meet up with you, get the money, give you a hug and kiss. We'll talk later. Was it still daylight? It was still daylight. Was it was still okay. daylight. So was after the fact. This was... I think the game was still on. Yeah, it was on. So the game was still on. Left stuff and used to go. Yep. Okay. The game was still on. So I was like, you know what I mean? I want to see you. I ain't seen you in like a month. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to lie and say, man, that's my baby mama. I love this woman. But I can't hang out with you. I can't so, do anything with you, you know, that type of thing, deal, and whatever the case may be. But, yeah, that. And this is on. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think the behavior right at the beginning is potentially truthful. He's using his left side to reference her behavior and his right side to discuss his own behavior. This lets us know potentially that using our left hand like this, which is on his right to describe things that he did and using our right hand, which is on his left 
to describe the actions of baby mama will help to get more connection and more information flowing because we're agreeing with where he gesturally references these things. This is also going to help when we get closer to confession time, and we're going to start those confession techniques, which we typically don't talk about on this channel. I'm going to reveal the five-step confession protocol here in just a few minutes that maybe uh, Scott's going to cut my head off for that. So when he's referencing this inability and unwillingness to meet up with baby mama or have sex with her, this is the only time we see a gesture completely centered around his crotch. But this is not genital protection. This is genital framing, and it's unconscious. So he's drawing the hands right down on the crotch. During this time in the video, I want you to see if you can spot that exact moment when it happens. Scott, what do you got? I'll just edit it out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't edit it out. Okay, I think these are great examples of, of how a deceptive person is using body language as a qualifier. Qualifiers are, you th are the things people use when they're telling a the lie, and you ask them a question, and when they lie, you just sit there and wait and don't say anything, and they keep adding things to it. Oh, where were you last night? Why, or why were you late to the cooking class last night? Well, I, I, I was late last night, but I had... Um, I had to run two errands that I had to get done. If I didn't get them done, then that would meant that the next day, you know, all of our kids would have, you know, wouldn't be able to do their stuff. And my car's having problems. They just keep adding things to, to the thing to make it, to prop up their answer, to make it sound more believable. And that's what he's doing with his body language here is he's doing these big gestures of, you understand what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Those kind of things. This this is such a great example of of illustrators and somebody. All we've talked about so far. This is going to be a great lesson. Some of these things I want to use in training. Actually, the nonverbal additives of his hands and his and his head when he's gesturing. Those should be words. When we're seeing that. That's what I'm talking about before. Where he's using those as qualifiers. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I'm just going to keep talking. I've got a whole list of qualifier things. It's going to it's going to get boring. It's going to start repeating. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's thin slice it even more because we don't even need to look at any of the gestures. We don't need to look at the face at all. All we need to get a sense of is the rhythm, and the rhythm tends to come from the tension in the muscles. And so what I've done in my muscles as I'm talking to you right now is I've tensed them all up for no kind of reason, and you get that kind of rapid delivery of just content, of just filling of air like you're getting from him at the moment. And if I just soften all those muscles and let them relax, then everything just kind of slows down after a while. So look, you can and just look at that just look at his body what you can see and go is it significantly more tense across the board is there more tension state a higher tension state in there in fact i would say the tension state that he's in right now is one that i call there's a bomb in the room it's there's a threat there think about that moment where you go where you've been looking for the bomb and suddenly you see it and how much tension would go into your body at that point because there's a threat and then imagine you had to fill the air with content that's what we're getting from him right now and it's a significant difference so i would say a big deviation or escalation from the baseline there uh greg what do you got on this one yeah, a couple of things. I'm not going to cover everything you've covered already, but when people are accustomed to talking to get themselves out of a bind, they will talk. And that's what we're seeing. This guy, we talk about him winning arguments. It probably isn't even winning arguments. He might be a pothead and that kind of stuff. But what he has done is know how to talk, 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 and move himself out of the way. I worked with a guy who had been an undercover drug guy in New York City for decades. You couldn't get a word in edgewise with this guy. And the reason was because that's how he stayed alive. He talked, 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 and kept moving things along. This guy's doing that. He's being helpful. Look at his hands. I'm being helpful. When he's throwing a bone where, about daylight, when he says, was it still daylight? Yeah, it was still daylight. But watch his hands drop down under the table and go to batter on deck, as I refer to it. When this is the biggest adapter you can possibly do is rub both your thighs at the same time. 
when we say an adapter, I have a different term for it than being comforting. When Joe talks about rep repetitious, repetitious, I think an adapter is simply making the uncomfortable or unknown comfortable. If I do the same thing in a different location, it makes me feel the same way. And I've watched it many times. You take a person out of the the wild where we capture them, you put them in, in a cage and you watch those things become more and more pronounced because they're taking control of the environment they're in. He does more of this declaration of compliance with the law. Hey, look, I, I followed a letter of the law with this restraining order, but I think he's still picking the lesser crime because then even if you go, well, you were not supposed to be there, it gives him something to talk about to keep him away. But what he doesn't realize and what people do when they're used to talking their way out of things is they talk themselves back into things sometimes. We would call him a barracks lawyer or something a little bit more unkind, but he is trying to outthink and outwit, but he's in the process putting himself right back where they want him, and that's in the vicinity of the action. So he's talked himself right into a hole. That's what we're seeing here. That's what, that's what I'm saying. She... If she can't get in touch with me, that's what she'll do. She'll go to social medias and do all this and try to okay. talk to people and all this and that. I got in contact with her through a mutual friend that we both know. And I was like, okay, tell her I'm out in Waukesha or whatever, and I'll meet up with her to get the money. And then she put us on the call. And she was just like, where are you at? Wait, call? Yeah. And she was just like, where are you at? I'm like, look. I don't know where I'm at. Do you still got that money? She's like, yeah, I want to give you the money, and I want to, I want to do this and do that. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna hang out with you. I'm gonna meet up with you, get the money, give you a hug and kiss. We'll talk later. Was it still daylight? It was still daylight. Okay. It was still daylight. So was, after that, this was, I think the game was still on. Yeah, it was on. So the game was still on. Left stuff and used to go. Yep. Okay. The game was still on. So I was like, you know what I mean? I want to see you. I ain't seen you in like a month. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to lie and say, man, that's my baby mama. I love this woman. But I can't hang out with you. I can't do anything with you, you know, that type of thing, deal, and whatever the case may be. But, yeah, that. And this is on. Whatever the case may be, but, yeah, that. And this is on your cell phone? The three-way call, obviously, it's your cell phone because you're not no, home, right? My friend's phone. Friend's phone. Yeah. But yesterday, so do you have your phone? No. That's what I'm saying. No. So who is the friend whose phone you were using to talk to at her on a three-way call? I don't want to say his name because I don't want to. Okay, I guess. So you saw her, though. Right? You met up with her. Okay. So... How did the conversation with her end? With me walking off and her being pissed off that I didn't want to hang out with her. I said, look, I'm not supposed to be around you. I'm gone. Okay. When she whose said, car oh, did you use to get out she there? said, I didn't, I didn't have a car. No, whose car did you use to get to Waukesha? My friend, my friend is the one that said he was going to go hang out and watch the Packer game. I said, I'm going to go with. Okay. Whose car did you use to get out to Waukesha? I didn't use anybody's car. Where does your friend live? That My friend lives in Milwaukee. So you, you didn't walk to Waukesha. Whose car no. did you guys use? My to friend. I just said it. My what friend type of car is he? I'm just trying to figure out how you got here. Yeah, I know, but it seemed like you trying to like spin me up or something. Like I'm just asking how you got here. Whose car did? Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so they're right on top of him now. Here's what uh, suggests it to me is his arms come, let's see if I can do it, hang on, right in like, there we go, <laughs> right in like that to cover his belly. <laughs> He's now covering his elbow joints here and his fingers have tucked away. That's a massive deviation. I don't believe you've seen him do that at all anywhere else and he tucks right in so huge deviation and protection he's protecting the belly area here if that gets damaged he's in big trouble if something takes control of his elbows then you know he hasn't got control of this part of his arm if something takes control of his fingers or damages those he's in big trouble so super protective at that point and then there's a retreat back and a slap from him a retreat back and a sound we haven't heard a lot of that slap 
before, maybe just once, I think. And that, again, would suggest to me that this issue that's being talked around of the car at the moment is significant. Well, we know it's significant, but if we didn't know its significance at this point, we'd know we were onto something around the vehicle because of that retreat back and the slap and those protective measures, huge deviation from his normal, uh, quite strange behaviors. Uh, Chase, what do you think on this one? Yeah, that was one of the first things I picked up on. I read it that how did the conversation with her end? There's the belly protection with the wrist turning inward, leaning forward. So we have the belly protection, which is the only place our rib cages don't cover. So we're soft. They call it the soft white underbelly. But uh, we have artery protection too. The wrists, the uh, the brachial arteries are all being protected. So we have artery protection and belly protection occurring at the same time. And not just the arms coming up, the leaning downward like this brings the rib cage down to protect all of those organs. And this is a natural response. It's not conscious. This is the strongest deception or stress that we've seen yet, or at least the likelihood of it. And he got a lot more comfortable the moment the question was asked about the car. So there was something that happened that made him comfortable toward the end of the video. And you can see it happen. You can see all of that, all that protection go away. And he gets comfortable at that moment. Let's see if you can identify what it, what it might be, Greg. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's real comfort or feigned comfort. Not really sure, Chase, because there's this, there's one thing in there that makes me wonder, and that's he goes to an oblique angle and he goes to internal voice. So I'm not sure if it's intentional and maybe this is something that's been successful for him, but I see exactly what you see, that open and change. That that was on my list. So there's a, a few things going on here. He's distancing, he's he is evading, and he is delaying. If you can't see those three, you can't interrogate. So what he's doing first by distancing, we always say, Chase, you talk about separation. Well, this is six degrees of separation in the opposite direction. This is not trying to get closer. I made a three-way phone call, not on my phone, on my friend's phone call, so that that's the only way I could get through to him. This sounds like counter-terror stuff where nobody knows anybody and they have to get through third-way calls. So there's the first one. That is distancing. He doesn't answer the question. He's using all of this complexity to delay because the event he cares about is about to come up. That's where it gets hot. We said, what happened at the end of that? Now we got a problem because now he's being moved to the event that occurred where he drove angrily away and drove over the people. So now we got a point where he has to get some way of getting away from the discussion. When he, when he does that cross and that self-hug mark, I'm with you. He's protecting as much as he can. I don't think he even knows how. He's very careful not to admit any use of the car. It's even abnormal conversation for him. If you pay attention, this could be a great chance time for this detective to change drives. And instead of saying, what kind of car did you drive? Say, how did you get there? And so now you force the guy to answer your question. Whose car was he driving? Then you see that the, the sheriff or the, the detective kind of loses interest and realizes it's time to back off from all that. And then he gets it. He starts poking on him and asking questions about what happened at the end of you talking to her. You see that dramatic difference. Then you see him go into that evasive move and then he comes back out with that explosive. Why are you trying to spin me up? That's all, in my opinion, that's all something he's done many times. This is, you hear me say it a million times. The organism does what made the organism successful. Chase, this is probably how he won his arguments. Wait a minute, crazy guy in the room. I'm going to back off on this one. But we see a very big difference at that one crux of the matter. Now they're closing those concentric circles we talked about. And we're starting to see it tighten up and he can feel it. Yeah. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree. You could, you could feel him getting boxed in there. And that corner, I agree with Chase where, right out of the gate here, when you, Chase, where you're talking about the placement or everything. They got him cornered in there. That's, you know, quite often you want to you wanna watch that. I would pull that away from the wall a little bit myself. The room may not be very big. We don't know what the other side of the room looks like, but that, that looks like. But as they box him in, that, that corner keeps getting smaller and smaller. And as we've seen before, some people get up in that corner. Uh, who's the... the uh, police officer with a, with a pulse claw yeah he's the one that got backed up in the corner so far he almost went through the wall 
Um, <laughs> but so anyway, but I, I think you guys are right. And going back to that part, I've seen, I'm familiar with this type of lie and I've seen it as you guys have a thousand times. And he, he's used this same setup to do that. And that's what he's doing because he's comfortable there. That's where he comes, like you said, Greg, the re, what makes you, what makes the organism successful. That's what they'll keep doing. He's coming out doing a, uh, I'm not going to say a great job, but he's doing what he does at that point. And he completely shuts down before that. When he starts talking about all those things, like you were saying, Greg and Mark as well, he's completely shut down. I mean, he gets so small. He's, he's beyond turtling. He's almost a snail up in there, curled up in his shell. He's getting so tiny at that point. Then we're seeing mercy hands, those flat hands, palms up, like, please, you know, please have mercy on me. This, I'm sure his brain is on fire right now as limbic system trying to decide whether they're going to drop the hammer on that car ride or not as they try to get him to talk about the car. And in a few minutes, we're going to see, uh, well, I'm, I, won't, I won't hit that. But I think this is great because we can, you can feel the tension building in there as they get him closer and closer and start boxing him into that little corner over there. He's not moving to the corner, but you can feel that, that he's getting boxed in. When I see that, I can't help but think he's being pushed into a corner at that point. Whatever the case may be, but yeah, that. And this is on your cell phone. You, the three-way call obviously is your cell phone because you're not no, on, right? My friend's phone. Friend's phone. Yeah. But yesterday, so do you have your phone? No. That's what I'm saying. No. So who is the friend whose phone you were using to talk to? Hit her on a three-way call. I don't want to say his name because I don't want to. Okay, I guess. So you saw her though, right? You met up with her. Okay. So how did the conversation with her end? With me walking off and her being pissed off that I didn't want to hang out with her. I said, look, I'm not supposed to be around you. I'm gone. Okay. When she said, car did you use to get out? She said, I didn't, I didn't have a car. No, whose car did you use to get to Waukesha? My friend, my friend is the one that said, he was gonna go hang out and watch the Packer game. I said, I'm gonna go with. Okay. Whose car did you use to get out to Waukesha? I didn't use anybody's car. Where does your friend live? My friend, friend lives in Milwaukee. So you, you didn't walk to Waukesha. Whose car no. did you guys use? My to get friend, out I just said, my what friend. What type of car is he? I... I'm just trying to figure out how you got here. Yeah, I know, but it seemed like you trying to, like, spin me up or something. Like, I'm just asking how you got here. Whose car did you stay me up or something? Like, I'm just asking how you got here. Whose car did you drive out here? I didn't drive at all. Whose <laughs> car did you come out here in? My friend. Okay, right. What kind of car is it? So here's the thing, Darrell. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, she's coming at us. I told her she's talking about some domestic related issues, okay? Um, you know, and I don't know if she's on BS. I don't know if she's not. I'm telling you. Hold on, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. Let me finish. I don't want you to get... Yeah, because you... Hold on, let me finish. You know, I don't entirely know all that, okay? I'm just right now trying to figure out how you get out here. So I got to step out with my partner for a minute. Just relax. Don't, I don't want you to get you all nervous, okay? But, you know, I'm not trying to be confrontational, but I, I don't think when you meet her out in Waukesha, and you're not from Waukesha, I think a reasonable question is to ask, how did you get out here? Yeah. Whether you drove, someone else drove, and if so, when you got out here, what type of car you were in? So just um, every hour or so, my boss, he knows we're out here. I just got to call him, say, yeah, we're talking. I'll call you back later. Just got to step out, throw in a line with him, and we'll come back. Just chill out here, enjoy your soda. We'll be right back. All right? Sound good? Okay. So we done talking or no no no, 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 no just chill out and we'll be back and we just gotta make that call. That, so i just gotta make that call that check-in call all right in the middle of the conversation well do you want to tell me about the car we'll just go another couple minutes yeah but i'm I'm i mean just, i gotta call him i can come back but i just all that listen I'm, I'm, all right greg what do you got yeah, this is an interesting one because now we're going to see interrogators at work. Long before there was a Reed method, there was a Hans Scharf method. And the Hans Scharf method that came out of World War II is about non-course of interrogation, and you would call it tricks, ruses, or ploys. 
when we tell you that we lie, we deceive, we do something, it isn't that we lie to you about evidence we have, it's that we let on we may have something that we don't. And one of the approaches that is the single hardest approach for interrogators to learn to ro- run is something called futility. And it's why are you wasting my time? And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a very elegant approach to that with a termination. If I were teaching termination to you, I couldn't teach you a better version of it. <clears throat> what we do is we say, there's something that needs my attention. I got to go validate or verify something you said, whatever we may make up to take a break. And then we reinforce the approach that worked, whatever we were saying before, hey, you're kind of in a bind. We're here to help you. We're your friends. We do that. We reinforce rapport. And he does a great job of reinforcing it, saying, look, we're not trying to be confrontational. He even gives him homework. We'll be back in a few minutes. I love that. Then he tells me as a boss, his reason he's leaving, he's insinuating, hey, we're going to leave. And this is your chance. And the guy's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. It works wonderfully. You see him doing that in the beginning of it. You see him doing that Frankenstein turtling again. His arms are stiff and his head's down in his in his chest. That's supposed to mean helplessness. But usually when we are doing helpless things and we raise our shoulders, our elbows bend and our hands come up. We don't see that. Interrogator move one. When you know the interrogator is about to start really closing the loop, one of the best indicators and giveaways is that lean in and say, I'm going to shoot straight with you. That's a great indicator. There are millions of ways to do it, but that's one of the most. It's always that. It's a matter of how you word it and how you do it. Then I love the fact he does one of my favorite moves. Well, that's that. Closes the book. All of those notes he's been taking, that's a figurative and an actual close the book on him. And you watch the guy's reaction. There's some relief, but there's also concern. Then he goes into that termination. This is a beautiful piece of interrogation work because he's playing on this guy's psyche now and the guy wants more. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. And those two guys are working together so well, so well. His, his partner is so subtle. Well, we got a couple of minutes. We, you know, I guess we got a couple more minutes. Just great. They work together really well. So it was, it was, as we're watching that, we're all getting excited watching that because we know exactly what he's doing. It was, uh, so smooth and so really nice. So I won't cover the things you covered in there because I'll just be reiterating. But he, when he asked what kind of car he came out in, and then he lets him off. And you go, hmm, I would ask more questions here. And then as you, as he keeps going on and he starts uh, getting around the car and explains to him he can't get the car out of him, that's when he goes to, well, I've, you know, I've got to talk, I've got to go talk to my boss because I have to call him every little while and tell what we're doing and where we are. Oh. It was it was great. It was great. You 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 covered most of everything on that, Greg. So I'll uh, I'll move it on to Mark. What do you got? Yeah. So what I love is the response that uh, that that creates because there's a lot of pattern interrupts there, and so it it pulls him off uh, the, the subject's usual uh, erratic demeanor to three moments of complete freeze. He's absolutely still at three moments. He'll shift from one freeze to another freeze to another freeze. But there are moments there where he may as well be, you know, a wax, you know, model there because nothing is happening as his brain goes, what on earth is going on here? I don't know what's going on. This is a pattern I haven't seen. He doesn't have a pattern to play in that. So he's, he's looking for help. He's looking for a pattern that he will he will recognize of course them sitting back down again is a pattern that he recognizes and he can get back into that now comfort with with playing that role uh you know it's interesting uh greg that you say you know there's a psychological effect because in the world that i come come from we we have a metaphorical gesture which is where you would close an actual book on somebody as the metaphor of i'm closing the book on you we have psychological gesture which is the book isn't there but i close it and and tell you and that's that's again to affect your psyche that the book is closing on you rather like I might you know pull the rug from underneath you at some kind of point as well or or shoot you dead with an idea okay uh lovely lovely to see all that great effect uh Chase what do you got on this one yeah right at the beginning here we see the interviewer matching the body posture of the suspect which is great and let me just walk you through how this technique works really fast the suspect begins this very typical response to this tactic being used. And here's what's happening from an interrogation perspective from the beginning. Number one, the interrogator builds trust and rapport. Next, the interrogator frames his presence as being there to help and assist. 
and presents himself as the only thing capable of helping this situation. Then the moment the interrogator starts pulling out of the room, the help and assistance is disappearing. And it just creates this feeling of a loss of safety or a potential loss of safety. So this builds just this incredible amount of discomfort and uncertainty in this suspect. And the response to this uh, is negotiation. I want to negotiate. So that's where you see these these uh, pleadings. And this is where you see it, his back hit the chair toward the end of the video. You see his back hit the chair and the status and power are reaffirmed and a window to more information is created in that moment. That interrogator created a window to more information because the power and status was reaffirmed. Only one person can close the book in that room. And he did. That's all I got. All right. I had to give it to Chase that time. No, I give it to Greg. Chase. He had he had uh, Glabella involvement with that one. <laughs> That's because I always See, I, have it. <laughs> I don't have any control. It's just you, there. You won't let me give you one, Chase. There you go. You had that one. I guess because you. you're just giving them out because I complained. <laughs> no, it was the best. Pay me up or something. Like, I'm just asking how you got here. Whose car did you drive out here? I didn't drive at all. <laughs> what car did you come out here in? My friend. Okay. Right, what kind of car is it? So here's the thing, Darrell. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, she's coming at us. I told her she's talking about some domestic-related issues, okay? Um, you know, and I don't know if she's on BS. I don't know if she's not. I'm telling you. Hold on, you. let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I don't want you to get... Yeah, because you know... Hold on, let me finish. You know, I don't entirely know all that, Okay. I'm just right now trying to figure out how you get out here. So I got to step out with my partner for a minute. Just relax. Don't, I want you to get you all nervous, okay? But, you know, I'm not trying to be confrontational, but I, I don't think when you meet her out in Waukesha and you're not from Waukesha, I think a reasonable question is to ask, how did you get out here? Yeah. Whether you drove, someone else drove. And if so, when you got out here, what type of car you were in? So just... Um, Every hour or so, my boss, he knows we're out here. I just got to call him and say, yeah, we're talking. I'll call you back later. Just got to step out, throw in a line with him, and we'll come back. Just chill out here, enjoy your soda. We'll be right back. All right? Sound good? Okay. So we done talking or? No, no, no. no, no. Just chill out. We'll be back. We just got to make that call. That, so I just got to make that call. That check-in call. All right? In the middle of the conversation. Well, do you want to tell me about the car? We'll just go another couple minutes. Yeah, but I'm, I'm I mean, just, I got to call him. I can come back, but I just... All that, listen, I'm... Tell me about the car? We'll just go another couple minutes. Yeah, but I'm... I'm I mean, just, I got to call him. I can come back, but I just... All that, listen, I'm, I'm willing to... Listen, Carpenter, you been straight up with me, you been straight up with me, right? Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is I just want to know what I'm looking at and if I can just notify my girls, that's it. I don't have a problem with talking to you guys at all. I just want to know what am I looking at. That's I it. At the start, she called about some domestic abuse related stuff. Now, I didn't talk to her myself. I told you that at the start. You said she was crazy. We talked about Y'all know that. Y'all talked yeah. to the woman. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, Other I apologize. You talk. Slow to the officers that we listened to the interview. Slow down, Did, did she look beat up? Be, like, dude, Darrell, like, come on me. now, man. Slow down, dude. All right? We can't explain it to you if you keep talking over us. You know what I'm saying? All right? I didn't talk to her. I didn't see her. Okay? Now, that, and then she makes this complaint when she gets you back. Yeah, and it's and like, why did you do this and to me? And, and I, I promise you, I promise you, my right hand to God Almighty on the throne with Jesus next to his side. The woman is going to sit up there and say, I was drunk, I was mad, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, now I got to go through everything just for you to do that. Why did you do this to me? So you think she's going to come back to us? Chase, what do you got? Yeah, let's just walk through exactly what happened in this video. And you'll see it here when you go back and we do the replay. 
There's severity softening, which means a person's using different words or avoiding words of a crime that occurred. There's an inability to identify any perpetrator or say somebody's a bad guy. There's no denial. There's negotiating with the interviewer. There's an inability to mention the crime or violence. He uses, uh, uh, I think, the words mad and drunk. The promise was that she would say that, not that it didn't happen. I promise my hand to God that she's going to say those things. That's a promise that is meaningless and has nothing to do with the substance of, of what they asked him about to begin with. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. I think he's doing all that because he doesn't know what to say. He's in a panic mode. I think his brain is on fire at this point. I think his limbic system is freaking out in there. I bet you could hear that thing humming in there if you put your ear up on the side of his head because he, he doesn't know what to do. He, he cannot wait. He can't hardly stand it. He wants to know if they know about that, what he did with that car or not running over those people. He can't hardly stand it. And we're seeing that panic kick in. And you're right. When they're getting ready to leave, is the, the safety net's gone. What he's used to seeing, what he's used to having, what he's used to controlling or thinks he's trying, he's controlling, he's trying to control at that point. They're getting up and leaving. And again, I think they did a beautiful job of that, the way they, they executed that. And the, and the partner of the guy, of the inter interviewer asking the questions, man, he did, he did such a fine job. He would just throw little things in there, here and there. Really good. Really, I think he did a really good job. And I'm sure he's the one that's mostly observing at that point. When they, uh, when they come back in, again, he reiterates what he wants to know. He, he, he lets them know what, what, all's, what all's going on. What do you, in other words, what do you think's happening? What are we talking about here? Because he's waiting for that hammer to drop about, about killing those people. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we know it's effective because we have a massive deviation from baseline once again, and we don't need to see the eyes, we don't need to see the face, we don't even need to see any little motor gestures in the hand. What we see is the whole of him get taken over by gravity around we can't explain it to you. At that point, when the interrogators say, we're not going to give you the information on this, he's completely defeated on that one. But then opposite this hand to God idea goes right above his head at that point. So he goes from earth up into heaven very, very quickly. That's a big move. That's a big gesture. We haven't seen him do anything like that before. Just that big move there suggests that this is a very different situation for him right now and a different situation than he is usually in. He's used to be in these kind of police interviews, I think, but never under this level of crime. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm not going to cover the same things you've covered, but we go back to his original question. Did anybody die? This guy may or may not know that people died. He knows he's in a bind. He doesn't know what they know. He can't prove the vehicle, but it's starting to close in on him and you can feel it. He's got guilty knowledge and evasion about what he knows. What am I being charged with? What am I being charged with? Well, you know when a person's asking that they have guilty knowledge and they're they're feeding you the opportunity to go after him. He'd be happy to trade guilt for the restraining order, for yelling or any other thing at this point. And so you start to see his body locking up and him closing down. And I agree with all of you. He's in he's in cat brain. He's not thinking. This is where being an interrogator has a feeling to it. I always say to people, when a person says, what makes a good interrogator? I say there's that special sauce that is the ability to feel when something is not there. And this is the only voodoo witchcraft you'll ever hear me say. You've got to know when that moment is there, you got to feel it. And when you feel it, you got to try to prove yourself wrong. So I can feel this guy wants to know something. Now I'm going to trade him something. But you have to work really hard not to get the wrong piece of information. And you don't lie and give him information that isn't true because you can go from we know all to we don't know anything with one fact. The other one you got to be really careful about in a criminal investigation where you're after confession is that you feed him a piece of guilty knowledge that he doesn't know, because that's how a false confession can be believed. One of the biggest tests for an interrogator is to try to verify false information in the prisoner. If the prisoner validates something that is not true, then you know they probably are not the right one. You see it in false confessions all the time. A guy, there's a great one I just found last week that we'll do here shortly. It's got the one I call and say this is the best bad interrogation I've ever seen. They tell this guy iteratively exactly what happened to somebody, and he confesses to it. He was nowhere near the situation. So you got to be careful. You hedge in the beginning. You never lie if you have a chance to avoid it. And then you got to be careful with that. My other favorite thing, he's got a Will Ferrell moment about holy ground here. You know, 
baby Jesus in a, you know, it just goes on and on and on. How about as God is my witness might be enough, not as God is my witness sitting in the throne with Jesus by his right hand and Mary on the phone. What are we doing there? You know, you just keep adding and adding and adding. And anytime we hear high or holy ground, we always go, hmm, why did that come up now at the hot button instead of earlier in a normal conversation? Tell me about the car. I'll just go another couple minutes. Yeah, but I'm... I'm I mean, just, I got to call him. I can come back, but I just... All about, listen, I'm, I'm willing to... Listen, Carpenter, you've been straight up with me. You've been straight up with me, right? Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is I just want to know what I'm looking at, and if I can just notify my girls, that's it. I don't have a problem with talking to you guys at all. I just want to know what am I looking at. That's me. Yeah. At the start, she called about some domestic abuse-related stuff. Now, I didn't talk to her myself. I told you that at the start. You said she was crazy. We talked about Y'all know that. Y'all talked yeah. to the woman. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, other I apologize. You talk Slow to the officers that we listened to the interview. Slow down, Did, did she look beat up? Did she be, like, dude, Darrell, like, listen, come on now, man. Slow down, dude. All right? We can't explain it to you if you keep talking over us. You know what I'm saying? All right? I didn't talk to her. I didn't see her. Okay? Now, that, and then she makes this complaint when she gets you back. Yeah, and it's and like, why do you do this man. to me? And, and I, I promise you, I promise you, my right hand to God Almighty on the throne with Jesus next to his side. The woman is going to sit up there and say, I was drunk, I was mad, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, now I got to go through everything just for you to do that. Why did you do this to me? So you think she's going to come back to us? No, nah, not you. Not not, not y'all saying that. But it's just, it, I feel that way because you're trying to, trying to guess. I, I know you heard that. Oh my God. Uh. Oh, that hurt. Sure. I know you heard that. that. I heard it. Can check. We're gonna go check with them. Maybe they'll listen to us a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Let's oh. check. Yet. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Give us a minute. Ah. Uh, see what we got. Dude, they it gotta how, how, it gotta be something wrong, man. How in the hell does it? Sometimes sprains will pop too. Yeah, but yeah, why is it hurting like this? And they say there's nothing. Dude, the sprains can actually be more painful than a break. Yeah. Whatever, whatever they got, whatever they did, bad. it hurt so bad. Mm -hmm. You want to keep the food? Why don't you keep the food in the soda and we'll be back in the kitchen? Ah. ah. Let's All right, I think I'll go first on this one. You know, when they left the room, they went right next door and were watching this on the monitor. They had to be. And I, the thing that I'm flabbergasted, the flabbergasted I can't believe they didn't come in laughing. I can't believe they can. I, 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 hats off. I respect these guys for not laughing in this guy's face when they came in like that because they saw all that going on. I think that's awesome. And obviously his arm didn't really hurt. When you when you get hurt like that, you'll you'll you won't talk a lot at first cuz you're worried about what's going on. You'll be pull, feeling around on and going, "Oh man, something's wrong." You won't be that that whole we all know it's fake cuz we saw it fake, but I mean, I don't know where to go with that. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think what we're really seeing here is a very strong desire to connect and build rapport with the interviewers. He's wanting them to identify with a, a similar experience. Like, I know you've had something pop before. 
And in an interrogation, this is when you build uncertainty more with an extended absence. And in my experience, it's even more effective if you come back into the room and then realize that you forgot something and then immediately pop back out for a few more minutes. So you give a, a, an idea of salvation and then you leave again within five seconds of coming into the room. And of course, this is just next level faking. And I'm sure that's just glaringly obvious to everybody, which is probably why uh, Greg and Scott wanted to put this clip in there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, I, you know, I just treat this as a deviation from baseline because we've not heard anything so far or any maneuver around pain in the shoulder at all. So, look, whether it was real or not real, and clearly it's not real, I mean, clearly that's the case. But even if it were real, we could still treat it as a deviation from baseline because it's like, why didn't you mention it before? Why now? Especially as there's now resource on the table. We now got a burger there. Some other items have shown up. So there's some change. Some resource has been put on the table. Deviation from deviation from baseline there from the from the uh, the the interrogators because they haven't they haven't been there all day just going have another burger have another burger have another burger they've been doing you know uh, tell us something tell us something tell us something we won't tell you something now here's a burger now I've got a pain in my shoulder now people leave and and I think. Um, there's threat threat detection going on there. Having a look at the papers, is there threat there? I think the checking of the phone, and I think he's trying to do nine for an outside line or something like that. Um, and whether it's plugged in or not is 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 a whole other whole other story. Um, but I think that's because he's looking for escape routes. That's one, you know, there's no win, there's no windows to look for, is my expectation. He knows where the door is. What's his other exit strategy? Well, disappear through the phone line. Could I get something via the phone line? Could I exit via the phone line? It, it's a bizarre way to think, but obviously, you know, he's in a complete reptile brain at this point, or cat brain, as, as Greg would say. Um, uh, he's, he's not thinking straight. And for the unconscious mind, a phone would be a good way out. I mean, you know, could easily go, oh, I, sorry, guys, I can't talk. I've got a, got a phone call at the moment. Uh, you know, Her Majesty is uh, calling me right now. So who knows? Who knows what he's thinking? Uh, yes. I would say he's now getting frustrated and defeated by, by the behaviours that I'm seeing from him. Uh, Greg, what do you see? Yeah, so a couple of things. I think all the, ch all the shoulder is is chaff. And if his shoulder pop, then he can go, ah, ah, now he gets to not talk about what matters. And that's all it is. It's a way to get away. And he's going to lean into it just because the police grabbed him and he's saying, what well, your other guys did to it and all those kind of things. Let me tell you, I live in a world where most of the people you deal with are not necessarily whole when you get your hands on them, because when you're in a war, people get hurt. That's the way life works. Chase, same thing with you. And sometimes it would be injured. You never, never, never play down an injury, ever, ever, ever. If it's a minor bruise, I would say, oh, my God, that's awful. I've never seen anything quite so bad because now I can help you. I can bring you resource. Mark, to your point of the person controlling the resource is a parental figure. So always the person who can make your life better. Also, you don't ever want to make people think that life is easier than it is. So we take advantage of it. Look, I mean, when I'm talking about injured, I'm not talking about severely injured because those people were not allowed to talk to. They're taken over into medical facilities and that. And there's certain restrictions on who's allowed to talk to people in medical facilities and which role you play. So intelligence interrogation is a different game than this. But when you're in a war, people get injured. So we always make sure they're cleared up. That's just him chaffing. But here's the funniest part to me. They go out of the room. They leave him there. Two things. Mark, if the phone is connected, it's probably to the control room yeah. in my world so that the person there would patch any calls through. It wouldn't be that that person would have a chance to call. But given a choice, I'll hand you your cell phone. Talk to your friends, please. I want to hear what you're talking about. I love to hear what's inside your little noggin when you're talking to your friends. I uh, The other part I love is when the people come back, he automatically covers like, oh, there's no nothing happened. Like there's not a camera right there that you can clearly see unless you just don't know. And th this is why good, good confession interrogation works is because you close the space so that the only people in the room are you and the guy. 
they can't tell that there are many other people watching. There might be a dozen people watching this, probably are dozens of people watching this, considering what happened and when. What you, the other piece you would do is I might leave something in my notes. This guy's lying, you know, whatever I'm doing. I would not leave any information that he shouldn't know in my notes, but I would leave my notes there. I might even leave something that's incriminating to see if he would tear it up. It's all intentional. Anything an interrogator does to quote Jeremiah Denton and the guys from when hell was in session, he's a trick, a ruse, or a ploy. No, not you, not, not, not your opinion, yeah. man. But it's just, it, I feel that way because you're trying to, trying to just, I, I know you heard that. Oh my God. Uh, all right. Sure. I know you heard that. I heard it. Heard it. I didn't check. We're gonna go check with them. Maybe they'll listen to us a little bit better. Mm -hmm. well, let's check. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. Give us a minute. Ah. Uh, see what we got. Dude, they it gotta how, how, it gotta be something wrong, man. How in the hell does it? Sometimes sprains will pop too. Yeah, but yeah, why is it hurting like this and they say there's nothing? Dude. The sprains can actually be more painful than a break. Yeah. Whatever so they got, whatever they did, bad. it hurt so bad. Mm -hmm. Want to keep the food? Why don't you keep the food in the soda and we'll be asking the God. Yeah. I think we got that title off. We'll be right with you. Oh, man. I'm calling yeah. Uber and I'm going home. That's it. Let me ask you this, Darrell. So you weren't out you weren't out in Waukesha Saturday, just Sunday. Yes, sir. Right? Okay. Nothing physical yesterday. Um, like I told you, you're a part in the investigation. There's a lot of parts, right? To any investigation. There's okay. investigation we talk about. Well, this domestic abuse thing I'm telling you about, okay. right? Okay. So wait, hold on. Let me. Oh, okay. let me go. I'm sorry. You I just had a about, question, but you talked about being a you know a religious man, right? I, I can, can do better. God. I can definitely do could. better. We all could. I'm not. We all could. No, that's why. Perfect. That's why. Yeah, yesterday, yesterday was a mistake. I should have just freaking watched the game and just yeah. fucking went home, right? Because uh, that's the thing. What do What do they teach us in Christianity? Throughout that they teach us that we're broken, right? We're sinners. Even when we're born, we're born sinners. We're broken. That's why Psalm 51, we're so 17. thankful for God's grace and forgiveness, right? When we ask for it, um, even though we don't deserve it, but when we ask for it, He gives it. All right. You're a father. You got three children. 18. Is it 18, 14, and seven? Yes, sir. All right. You got a mama that raised you well, and a God you you believe in. Absolutely. All right. And all of them are, here's the thing the law want, is to tell, that you're telling the absolute whole truth and nothing but the truth, right? Absolutely. So I hope you got it, right? Absolutely. It's all familiar. We've all heard that, right? Um, and I just have concerns if I fact check that Darrell's not telling me the truth. You don't have a car, so Marcus had to bring you out. You don't own a car, your mom doesn't own a car, right? So Marcus had to bring you out. So why did we find you with a car key in your pocket? It wasn't in my pocket. I don't even know where they said that was laying on the ground. That's yours. Yeah. It's it's it should have been by my ID. Yeah, it's yours. It's your car key, okay? Because it goes to a Ford Escape in your mom's name covered in Wonka Shop. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got?
Yeah. So here's an interesting thing for you. We talk about regulators and we talk about people regulating conversation with their hands saying your turn, my turn, wait, hold on. Here's an interesting point for you. Rarely does a person regulate in a conversation unless they're interested in what's going on. The only exception to that is they'll regulate to get out of a boring conversation. They'll try to rush it. But when a person is doing this much in interface with you, when you're talking to them, they care about what you're saying. And you can see it here. You can see his, his interest is peaked and he leans in when he hears more about the investigation. This cop does a really good severity softening move very quickly. He makes it not about the murder, not about the deaths. He makes it about the domestic violence issue. So he's going back into that guy's wheelhouse so he can talk. Then you see him do all that regulation. So wait, my fault. And then he puts that barrier back up. Then he moves into what we in, in the intelligence interrogation world would call love of as an approach, love of God in this case. You know, you've you've brought up God before. The guy knows, I mean, that when he brings up Psalm 51, 17, he's talking about broken and contrite and that stuff. He, so he knows he grew up in that world. Um, the de This detective is showing some stress when he's trying to run this approach. Look at his right leg. What we call an adapter, that jiggling of the leg is him trying to release nervous energy. And now this guy goes back to his closed posture, but this guy knows an approach when he sees when he's seen it before, when he goes in and he starts talking about no car, it, that's an amazing turn of events. When he says you had a key on you, that's a hard accusation to which he responds. I didn't have a key on me, but that lilt at the end tells you it's his key. He says, I didn't have it on me. He didn't say it's not my key. Love that. Then he goes in for the futility and does the close the loop. This concentric circles of questioning and tightening has really gotten to the point where this guy's on the grid, right on the griddle right now. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. He, he's got a new, not necessarily base baseline, but consistent behavior now throughout this uh, little clip, which is that, you know, the, the, the body is right over now. The head is quite hung. He's, uh, he's protecting uh, vulnerable areas here, the belly area, uh, the elbows and the fingers as well. You probably couldn't get a lot more protected than that, other than having rolled onto the floor and balled yourself up in the corner would probably be, you know, the, the, the next best, best uh, uh, way of dealing with this situation. Um, and I'm with you, Greg, that seeing that leg kind of jiggle along um, for me suggests that the interrogator here uh, is, is quite anxious to, to push forward uh, on this. And what a contrast to how his, um, his subject is at this point. So uh, lovely to see. And again, we're not having to look at the eyes. We're not having to look at the mouth at all. We're not having to look at any kind of fine motor skill at all or any grand gestures in any way. Just the way people are positioned and the consistent behavior that they're doing against other consistent behaviors that we've seen tell us enough uh, in this within the context. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Uh, here again, we're seeing uh, when the word investigation comes up, he stops him. And that's when we're seeing that big regu regulator. He wants to see what's going on. He cannot stand it. He wants to know what's going on so bad or what they know at this point. We've, we've covered so much of, of, of this guy so far at this point. There's not a whole lot extra to go on in there that I would add to it, um, especially since you guys have covered so much so far. But the, the big regulator, it's the first time we've seen that in there. So at that point, he closes down, kind of backs off after that. I don't think there's much more I can add from my perspective for that. Chase, what about you? Yeah, for just for technical specs here, this part of the interview is called a confrontation. And more specifically in, in some trainings, this is called a direct positive confrontation. So we're setting up, we're seeing the interviewer set up that what's called a theme from the beginning. So this is common and it, it's a, a well-executed technique of beginning the theme and going through what's called an agreement set, which is essentially where we're offering a lot of undeniable things listed out by the interviewer that the suspect will agree with so that a bond of agreement is built. This is a big moment for the interrogator. You can see it with his leg bouncing all over the place. When the interrogator makes an accusation, he couches it in several very specific ways. There's a hypothetical situation. I'm concerned about this. Then he uses the suspect's name in third person, which is more indirect approach. The only mistake here, and it was 
not a big one at all, was the interrogator uses the word we as who found the car keys in his pocket. We always want to separate ourselves from the authorities as much as possible. We want As interrogators, we want to separate ourselves from the people doing investigations, people who captured you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this helps to build the savior mentality that we're trying to achieve inside the suspect's mind. So it's always someone doing the investigation, somebody going out on the street doing the work on this. It's they. It's them. And I want to use team pronouns inside with me and this other person. I want to say us, our, we, what's our plan for this? This is our chance to get ahead of this, et cetera. That's all I got. Yeah, Chase. That's why when I always open up 90% of the time, it's like, hey, man. I'm not a cop. I can't arrest you. I can't do anything. They've asked me to come in here and talk to you and find out why you did this. You know, that way I could work into, you know, apologizing to them, which I've told that story before. I'm calling you over and I'm going home. That's it. Let me ask you this, Darrell. So you weren't out, you weren't out in Waukesha Saturday, just Sunday. Yes, right. Okay. Nothing physical yesterday. Um, like I told you, you're a part in the investigation. There's a lot of parts, right? To any investigation, there's investigation people we talk about. Well, this domestic abuse thing I'm telling you about, right? Okay. okay. So wait. Hold on. Let me. Oh, okay. Let me go. I'm sorry. You I just had a about, question. But... You talked about being a, you know, a religious man, right? I can do better. God. I can definitely all do could. better. We all could. I'm not. We all could. No, that's why. Better. That's why. See, yesterday was a mistake. I should have just freaking watched the game and just yeah. fucking went home, right? Because. And that's the thing. What, is, what do they teach us in Christianity, Darrell, that they teach us that we're broken, right? We're sinners. Even when we're born, we're born sinners. We're broken. That's why Psalm 51, we're so 17. thankful for God's grace and forgiveness, right? When we ask for it, um, even though we don't deserve it. But when we ask for it, he gives it. All right? You're a father. You have three children, 18. So 18, 14, and 7? Yes, sir. All right, you got a mama that raised you well, and a God you, you believe in. Absolutely. All right, and all of them yeah. are, here's the thing they'll all want, is to tell, that you're telling the absolute whole truth and nothing but the truth, right? Absolutely. So help you God, right? Absolutely. Sound familiar? We've all heard that, right? Um, and I just have concerns if I fact check that Darrell's not telling me the truth. You don't have a car, so Marcus had to bring you out. You don't own a car, your mom doesn't own a car, right? So Marcus had to bring you out. So why did we find you with a car key in your pocket? It wasn't in my pocket. I don't even know where they said that was laying on the ground. That's yours. Yeah. It's it's yours. It should have been by my ID. Yeah, it's yours. It's your car key. Okay, because it goes to a Ford Escape in your mom's name covered in Waukesha. Okay. Okay. Listen, Darrell. I'm trying to be as open and honest with you as I can be. You know, I'm Christian too, and believe me, I'm not perfect. And neither are you. And I'm not calling you a terrible man. I'm not saying you were out yesterday hunting and just let me finish. But you did not walk to that house. You did not walk to that house. You did not come here in a tan Kia. You didn't. Okay. Who? You did not come out here in a tan Kia. Okay. You got a key in your pocket to a car in your mom's name. Okay. And that key works for that car. For the love of God, Marcus. For yourself, for your family, you know what happened yesterday for the people. Tell me what happened. Well, what? With the car. What am I being With your mom's for? car. You're driving goofy, people called in. You drove out of there in your mom's car, the red car. You're driving a little silly, probably because you're pissed. You met up with Erica in the car at the park. Well, initially, I believe you told us the gas station. Do I have that right? And then you changed it to the park. So that's an analysis. No, no, I said the house was by the gas station. You, when you said, you said what was by You said you went Walmart. and it was by a gas station. That's where you met her. No, 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 no. I said I met her at the park. Okay. 
Okay. At a creek. Met her, you say it. You met her at the park in your mom's car. A red Ford Escape. She got in. You talked. And what you're telling me seems pretty consistent that there was nothing physical between the two. Of you. No, I didn't. No. But you met her in the car. I didn't put my hands on her. Nothing. But like you that. met her in the car. Can, what's going on, man? All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he's locked into position that he was in right from the start at the at the top of that. But now there's again going to be a, a, a slight and subtle change, which is he gets his hand out and he starts doing uh, table uh, presses with the tips of the fingers. So uh, there's more detail in there because the subject matter has changed now. You know, what are you what are you really talking about? What are you really interviewing me about? Because the subject matter has shifted. He's got a little more energy to try and win some form of argument around the detail. And so you see that with the detailed fingers there. He's given it his best go, but you're not seeing that big demonstrative, uh, you know, these big shifts that he'd normally do. He hasn't got the energy for it anymore, I think, quite frankly. He's 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 tired. I believe by now he's mentally spent, I think now. So he hasn't got the capacity to do the big arguments that he'd normally win. He's down to small little details and he soon gives up on that and retracts back again. So the subject has changed. He tries to change his behavior around that. He hasn't got his usual routines. He's gone back to balling up slightly He's definitely on the back foot right now. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Let's talk for a minute about the psychology of capture. What happens when you're in captivity? And at least two of us have been there. When you're in captivity is everything becomes about you and everything becomes black and white and everything becomes personal. And what we mean by that is you stop noticing everything around you. And clearly he has stopped noticing everything around him. This detective swings too soon. He swings too soon. This right here looks like pre-confession. We start to notice he's balling up, he's getting tight. What we look for in pre-confession is a person gets all balled up and all tight, and then they blossom open and their head drifts down to their right, and they start to talk slowly. When that happens, there's a process and a method we go through to get that. Now, usually that works best when it's one-on-one. -on -one. So having a second guy here, you might find a reason for him to get out of the room before now. He hasn't. This is also Chase brought it up very early in this interrogation. The table is not your friend. That table being between you means that now he's got a barrier. We're in a real confession when the guy is right on the edge and you're, you're ready to confess. Non-confrontational, comforting. I'll lean out and put my hand on his leg and say, it's okay, man. Everybody has made mistakes. And he tries. You hear him using the right language, using the right stuff, but he's a little bit too assertive. You need to be less assertive and more compassionate, more this is where empathy comes in. If you have no empathy, you can't be an interrogator. You just can't because you'll miss that point. You watch this progressively, see his arms getting tighter and tighter. That's a great indicator we're headed down that path. The threat's clear. This is working. Take the table out of the way. His voice tone has changed. You hear that? Everything's slower and darker. The detective is then immediately senses it because he's well-trained and he goes after it. He lowers his volume. If he would have that other guy out, he might not have made this swing too quickly, and he should have elicited instead of asking. I would have said, I think you can see where this is headed. That's all I got. Scott, what do you got? Well, I agree with you completely. I, he, he went in just a little bit too soon. It's all led up to this, and he's right there, man. But he just, And when they left, it would have been the perfect time to scooch over more toward the side of that table to get closer yep. to him if he was going to do that, if he would planned ahead. These things are, are malleable. They're organic. You know, it's it's tough to, to – you can always look back and make decisions about what you should have done and all that. But I agree. I think he came in a little bit too quick. He shut down. Everything was – at, at, Pretty soon I was waiting for that rocking to start happening. Didn't see that. Yep. But so close, so close. And I agree. I think if he, if he had been close enough to come in there, put his hand on him and in just like you did, man, I think that would have, I think that would, it may have changed, changed the game at that point. Having seen him in court afterwards now, no, right. it, it may not have, but may, and maybe he sensed that, you know, maybe he said, well, here is the shot. You got to go for it. Like you were talking about earlier, the feeling you get. Maybe he thought, this is it, man. I got to go. But watch the, watch his partner. He's so excited. He's 
swinging back and forth because he knows what's going on. He sees it coming too. They both know that's going to happen then, but he's so excited. He can't hardly stand it. So you see him swaying back and forth. You can see his, his knees going back and forth in there. So I think, I think, he, I think you're right, Greg. I think he just, it's, it's, he swung too soon, man. Swung too soon. And, so. and no beat. That's not beating him up because we're not in the room. It's really easy oh, yeah. to see, I guess. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. Cause we don't know. We weren't there. We can always look back and say, Oh, you should have done this, but I'm not doing this at all. I'm just saying, you know, as things go, that, that, that flow looked like it was a little bit too early. It may, it, but, but like I said, he may have seen that shot said, this is it, man. I got to go now because maybe he's, he's been there a lot longer with the guy. We're not, we're just watching it because man, he does such a great job on this. They both do. I think they did a fantastic job. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Or Chase, what do you got? Chase. Chase. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I've done that. I've gone way, way too early before because <laughs> just because I was excited. I had a tiny bit of compliance like for five minutes and I'm like, oh, they're ready. So I would jump in. And interviewer does a great job, uses even the same word that the suspect uses to start serious sentences saying, listen, that is great. I'm, I love that he did that. This is great work by the interviewer. And here are the secret interrogation techniques I promised. These are the kind of the priorities of the interrogator, I think, in order. Socialize the problem, minimize the problem, project, reassure, and rationalize. Not necessarily in that order, but I think videotape would have been very useful. Even a blank CD that's on the table labeled traffic cam and security footage on the CD would have this, I think just having it on the table, it would plant a mind virus so deep that there would be no escape from that. His eyes would be locking onto that, onto that DVD CD over and over. And these questions from the suspect are priceless. Innocent people don't do this. Innocent people don't do this. Okay. So this is a last minute attempt to just discover information before revealing anything. And we see this in just about every single episode of Columbo. Every episode. I want to get as much data as I can before I say anything. So the topic that gets concealed is typically the topic that you need to reveal. And I'll leave it with that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'll give you that, Chase. You got Thank that. You. Thank you. I earned that. Square, man. Yeah. Good one. Okay. Listen, Darrell. I'm trying to be as open and honest with you as I can be. You know, I'm Christian too, and believe me, I'm not perfect, and neither are you. And I'm not calling you a terrible man. I'm not saying you were out yesterday hunting. And just let me finish. But you did not walk to that house. You did not walk to that house. You did not come here in a tan Kia. You didn't. Okay. Who? You did not come out here in a tan Kia. Okay. You've got a key in your pocket to a car in your mom's name. Okay. And that key works for that car. For the love of God, Marcus. For yourself, for your family, you know what happened yesterday for the people. Tell me what happened. Well, what? With the car. What am I being With your mom's for? car. You're driving goofy, people call you in. You drove out of there in your mom's car, the red car. You're driving a little silly, probably because you're pissed. You met up with Erica in the car at the park. Now, initially, I believe you told us the gas station. Do I have that right? And then you changed it to the park. So that's an analysis. No, no, I said the house was by the gas station. You, when you said, you said what was by You said you went Walmart. and it was by a gas station. That's where you met her. No, 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 no. I said I met her at the park. Okay. At a creek. Met her, you say that. You met her at the park in your mom's car. A red Ford Escape. She got in. You talked. And what you're telling me seems pretty consistent that there was nothing physical between no, I didn't. No. But you met her in the car. I didn't put my hands on her. Nothing but like you that. met her in the car. Can what's going on, man? Her in the car. Can what's going on, man? I'm asking you a question. Just be. You were out there just driving kind of crazy. crazy. On, Some man. people said you were driving kind of crazy. We got reports of it. You got the key.
key, you got the car. Did you take the car or did your mom give you the car? I know you know what car I'm talking about. I just want to know. <laughs> so, so people not more than you all those okay, people no, 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 reported no, that no. car driving at Bitterrat. I, I know what you're saying. All I'm saying is this. All I'm saying is this. We all been straight up with each other. You knew it was more to what you was asking me yesterday. Didn't know that would sure. explain that would explain the FBI and all that, right? They're not here today. So if it's that big a deal, you don't see them here today. Come on, Kurt. We been we been. You just met in the car. We've been cool, yeah, man, right. the whole time. If I did something, yeah. if I did something yeah, wrong, that's serious, why they were here. But do you see them here today? They're not here today. Yeah, but but y'all lied to me, man. You made it seem like they just come for no reason. Well, here's the thing, Darrell. And I'm like, what hey, if I if it's listen to they, me for a minute? I can, I, apologize. You, I can give you a clean slate I, here. I, I apologize because you have lied to us as well because you came out here in the red Ford Escape. Okay, that is. But she came out here and had the key. All right. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of my favorites. I'll, I'll start with the end. This is Interrogator 101. A lot of intelligence interrogators, well, most of us don't have badges or credentials. We can't arrest. So we'll always say, look, I don't care what you did. Doesn't affect me, but I can't arrest you. or I'm not going to arrest you. And, and, and then we get what we need. We just hand them off to the agent who does have badges and credentials and takes them away. And they usually say, you lied to me. And you look at them and go, you lied first. That's usually the answer. That's how it works. And that's what he's in effect saying. This guy's interrogating the interrogator. He's trying to get information. He's running ploys. He's doing everything an interrogator does. This guy's seen this before. Look, I've seen this in real life where a guy's trying to find out what I know. Part of the reason I used to say interrogators don't need a top secret clearance is because we're talking to the enemy at all times. So what we need to do is to know what we need to collect, not why. So that's an important part of why top secret with access isn't always a, a part of being an interrogator. We, we did a show called Torture, the Guantanamo Guidebook, and there was a kid in there who kept trying to interrogate us at the same time we're doing it to him. So we see it all the time. It's real. It doesn't mean the guy has to be a bad guy in, in general. He can be trying to figure out what you're after and why, because it can be confusing. But guys like this, He's pretty smart. He's willing to throw away guilt at something small in exchange for something big. And those regulators show you what he's trying to do is to get control of that conversation and start driving. There's no value to him saying you lied to me, except for Chase. We're back to your initial posit that he always wins his arguments. And here's the animal doing what the animal does. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. And when you're in, I was never a teacher at Sears school, but when you're in, in Sears school, they give you a code word and you're thinking it's fake. It's not real. I have an inherent knowledge that I'm going to be safe. And within about 13 hours that disappears, it is completely gone. I had a code word. My code word was uh, Teddy Graham. <laughs> I'm serious. And I had to give, and I gave it up. I gave it up. And you'd be very surprised how effective this is, no matter how good you are at winning arguments. Right at this moment, did you take the car or did your mom give you the car? This is called an alternative question. And he's using it here for something other than the crime, which I think is very smart. And right at the moment he realizes everything's going to come out, you can see a perfect repeat of the abdominal covering behavior there, protecting the rib cage, all of this stuff. This is where you stop their advances. This is the point where you stop any kind of defensive behavior. And you might, uh, depending on your interrogation instructor, that this might be called a monologue. And when you launch into this, you want to do all of those things that an interrogator is supposed to do in a couple of paragraphs. You might say something like, you know, I know that's really important to you. And I promise we're going to get to that. But right now I'm running out of time where I can help you. When I walk out of that door, there's nothing more I can do to help you. This is our chance to let people know why all this happened. This is our chance to shape how your mom and your babies are going to see this, just to, to let people know that you made a mistake. You don't have to let people call you a monster. And I know you're not a monster, but there won't be a chance after I leave this room. And that would be a monologue, kind of minimizing and projecting it, reassuring that let's get your image 
correct here. Scott? All right, yeah. Coming into that, it looks like it's going to fall apart on him because because Durrell is is coming up against us. Hey, wait, we've been buddies, all this stuff. And it uh, he he to- totally controls, the, inv- the interrogator totally controls all that confusion and things because he's seen it time and time and time and time again and knows how to handle it. I think he did a great job at that point. Um, because it just it just looks like it's all falling apart because the guy's buttoning up against them all of a sudden they're 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 past the discussion part it's almost like they're arguing which is Darrell's wheelhouse and he's really good at that but he's not as good at it as the interrogator was at defending that and pulling it just everything he threw out he just took it apart got the little screwdriver out went ding 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 and everything just fell apart for him not the in, interrogator so Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it, it, you're right. It has got argumentative. I, I think argument is probably not the place it's meant to be going at the moment because argument for me is taking a bit of a step back. Uh, just as you were suggesting there, Chase, to, to for him to ball up and then not allow that and open him up that, that, he, that he feels there's somebody trusted that he can confess to, my understanding would be is that's the way it needs to go. I think it's always going to be a little bit argumentative because you're right, Scott, it's it's the subject's modus operandi is being a good arguer. And you see that he's, he, he's doing the digital table presses. He's He's got, a, you know, he's using his sharpest brain right now to try and argue this one out. They are continually in antagonism. Geometrically, they are antagonist, antagonistic towards each other. So, of course, they're going to argue. It's going to be the nature of the of the setup. Uh, just as people have been saying, it would have been better if they'd have got themselves into complement. And geometrically, that means you're on a 90 degree angle to, to somebody. So look, the, the geometry explains exactly what the psychology is going to be. Antagonistic, you will argue. Complement, you'll get on better with each other. If you're, if you're parallel to them, then you'll be thinking the same way. Uh, so it's no surprise that... Um, that it goes into into argument here and the subject is in his element and then it it reverts back again to to this process here so based on that i don't know where this goes my understanding is is there is no confession uh, at the end of this and so that possibly doesn't surprise me because because it's maybe now going to play out, and I don't know whether we've got more of this video, but it's maybe now going to play out in in balling up argument, balling up argument, uh, because that antagonism is going to be the pattern that's played out. Maybe you come back the next day, try something else, but I guess you can only hold somebody for so long. I don't know how this ended up, how they arrested him in the end, but, uh, but you know, lovely little um, uh, sequence there. They're in the car. Kid, what's going on, man? Asking you a question. Just be, you were out there Just driving kind of crazy. On, Some man. people said you were driving kind of crazy. We got reports of it. You got the key, you got the car. Did you take the car or did your mom give you the car? I know you know what car I'm talking about. I just want to know. <laughs> so... So people not more than all those okay, people no, 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 reported that no. car driving a bit erratic. I, I know what you're saying. All I'm saying is this. All I'm saying is this. We all been straight up with each other. You knew it was more to what you was asking me yesterday. Didn't know that would sure. explain that would explain the FBI and all that, right? They're not here today. So if it's that big a deal, you don't see them here today. Come on, car. Hey, we've been, we've been. You guys met in the car, in the park. We've been cool, yeah, man, the whole time. If I did something, yeah. if I did something yeah, wrong, that's why they were here. But do you see them here today? They're not here today. Yeah, but, but y'all lied to me, man. You made it seem like they just come for no reason. Well, here's the thing, Darrell. And I'm like, what hey, if I, if it's listen today, to for a minute. I can, I, apologize. Give you a, I can give I, you a clean slate I, here. I, I apologize. Because you have lied to us as well. Because you came out here in the Red Ford Escape. Okay, that is what you came out here in. You had the key. All right? Well, let's throw around the room one time and talk about what we 
think we've seen up to this point. See if we can keep it to 30 seconds or less. Mark, why don't you go first? Yeah, so uh, as I said right at the start, just because they're wearing a mask doesn't have to matter. You don't necessarily have to see what's happening in the face. Hey, it's an advantage if you can, but sometimes it's a disadvantage to have so much information. As I've told people who are on uh, our kind of mastermind course uh, that we do, our, our behavior panel board, is sometimes you want to purposely close down the information that you have and go really deep in a certain area to get a a economical result and hopefully that's been shown by just looking at the bigger body language in this chase what do you got yeah the the whole video the the relief we saw in the beginning because i think a lot of the behaviors we saw in the beginning was relief that he wasn't being investigated for the 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 murders and i think we saw that slowly fade away as he gradually realized that he was in that room and it was beautiful to watch. And to the detective who did this interview, we'd love to have you on the show. Uh, yeah. I, I think I speak for everybody. That'd be fun yeah. to talk to you. You did a great job and it's it, your technique was uncommonly good. Greg. Yeah. The, the detective's name is Jay Carpenter and yeah, we, <clears throat> we all agree. Yeah. You're welcome. Anytime. Just reach out a couple of things. This is a great, example of a real interrogation. Uh, look, when you're interrogating somebody who is innocent, it's very different than this. So like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What, what, what? There's none of that. This guy is fishing back. And I call it a glass wall for a reason, because both sets of people came in with an agenda. But look, if I didn't do something, I'm going to have an agenda too. I went off, I went out. But if I did something, I'm going to have a very different agenda. And you can see it because it will feel like there's a glass wall between us and that we're not talking to each other. We're talking at each other. And it's really hard to reach through there and pull that guy through the glass. He gets really close. He does a very effective iterative guilt approach on the guy, getting him, first of all, not talking about the thing he's going to charge him with, talking about something else to get him, put him at the scene of the crime, at the scene, then to take him a next step, then to pull him through. And he almost gets him there. But I think this guy's a hard nut to crack. Probably would have taken longer, maybe a different process. Plus, if you haven't seen the trial, this is a whole new circus. Maybe we'll do the trial next. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I don't think he was, I don't think it was possible to crack him at that point. He'd already made up his mind no matter what happened. Obviously, from what we'd seen in court, he wasn't going to say he did it. He was going to fight. He was going to fight to the end. And he did. It did work out so well for him. But yeah, but I agree with you. I think the interrogator did a fantastic job. And I comment his partner too, because he, or compliment his partner as well, because he did such a fantastic job of sitting there just lobbing little things in here and there just at the right time. It's almost like you're, you're baking something or cooking something. You got to put stuff in just the right time. And he would, I thought that, I thought he did a fantastic job. And I think, again, it's a great study in illustrators. And I've always used the O.J. Simpson ones where he he talks and he answers and they don't land where they're supposed to. These are so big and so huge where illustrators are landing where they're not supposed to and happen when they're when there's nobody when he's not saying anything, but expecting him to be accepted as words or statements. I, I think that's fantastic. I'll, I'll be using that uh, as well. I'm pulling those things probably this week sometime to start using. them. All right, fellas, I think this was a good one and I'll see you next time. The Behavior Panel.